Silence, all stand. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honours, and good morning, Commissioners. This is case study 55. I understand there are some people wishing to make appearances. Uh, may it please court, my name is Brennan, B R E W N A N, initials B G. I'm instructed by uh, Corny and Lynn's lawyers. I appear for the Australian Christian Churches. I should say, Your Honours, that uh, leave has been sought informally, but I formally seek leave to appear. You have that leave. Thank you, Your Honour. My name's Higgins. I appear for Hillsong Church. I'm instructed by pro legis lawyers. I seek leave to appear. Yes, you have that leave. <clears throat> yes, Michelle. This is the Royal Commission's 55th case study. This public hearing will inquire into the Australian Christian Church's Pentecostal movement in Australia and Hillsong Church, one of its affiliated churches. It follows the Royal Commission's inquiry into the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong in Case Study 18. Case Study 18 concerned the responses of the Australian Christian Churches and three affiliated Pentecostal churches to allegations of child sexual abuse. That public hearing took place in Sydney in October 2014. The report was tabled in Parliament in, on the 23rd of November 2015. In this hearing, the Royal Commission will inquire into the following topics. Firstly, the responses of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to Case Study 18 and other Royal Commission reports. Secondly, the current policies and procedures of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong in relation to child protection and child safe standards, including responding to allegations of child sexual abuse. Thirdly, how the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong have addressed each of the elements of the Royal Commission that the Royal Commission considers necessary for creating a child safe institution. Fourthly, the response of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to the Commonwealth Redress Scheme for Survivors of Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, which was announced on 4 November 2016 in response to recommendations made by the Royal Commission in its August 2015 report on redress and civil litigation. Fifthly, the response of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to recommendations concerning civil litigation made in the Royal Commission's August 2015 report on redress and civil litigation. And finally, the approach of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to mandatory reporting and reportable conduct schemes. The purpose of this hearing is not to inquire into individual sets of facts or particular events as has occurred in previous Royal Commission case studies. In this hearing, the Royal Commission will hear evidence from senior representatives from the Australian Christian Churches and from Hillsong. There will be two panels today. The first of those panels will comprise Pastor Wayne Alcorn, who is the national president of the Australian Christian Churches, Pastor Sean Stanton, who is the national secretary and treasurer of the Australian Christian Churches, and Mr Peter Barnett, who is the director of Safe Ministry Resources, which is an independent organisation engaged by the Australian Christian Churches to assist developing its child protection policies and procedures following case study 18. The second panel today will comprise the following representatives from Hillsong Church. First, Pastor Brian Houston, the founding senior pastor of Hillsong and chairperson of the Hillsong Board. Secondly, Mr George Agajanian, the general manager and company secretary of the Hillsong Church Board. Thirdly, pa Pastor 
Keith Ainge, the head of the Safe Church Ministry, and finally, Mr Kirk Morton, the Risk and Compliance Coordinator with Hillsong. Pentecostalism is a denomination of Christianity. It refers to a grouping of different churches based on common beliefs, most notably the belief in a direct personal experience of the Holy Spirit, such as speaking in tongues, prophecy and healing. A grouping of Pentecostal churches is referred to as a movement. Pentecostal churches voluntarily choose to affiliate and cooperate as a movement. Each affiliate church is self-governing. The Australian Christian Churches is the largest Pentecostal movement in Australia. The Australian Christian Churches was established in Australia in 1937, originally under the name of Assemblies of God. In 2007, it changed its name to the Australian Christian Churches. It has over 1,000 affiliated churches and over 315,000 constituents. The governing body of the Australian Christian Churches is referred to as the National Conference. The National Conference is a gathering of all the affiliated churches and credentialed ministers. The Australian Christian Churches is led by a national executive, which is elected by National Conference. The current president of the national executive is Pastor Wayne Alcorn, who, as I've already indicated, will give evidence today. Each state and territory is governed by a state conference with an elected state executive. The national conference delegates to the state executives matters such as managing the ordination of pastors and investigating complaints against credentialed <coughs> ministers. Decisions made at the state conference and the state executive level must align with decisions of the national conference and national executive. The United Constitution sets out certain requirements which a church must meet in order to be affiliated or registered with the Australian Christian Churches. A certificate of fellowship by the National Executive of the Australian Christian Churches is then issued to the affiliated church. The Australian Christian Churches recognises the autonomy of affiliated churches and has no authority to direct individual churches regarding local governance. However, the principles of cooperative fellowship place a responsibility on affiliated churches to function consistently with the United Constitution, state bylaws, and most importantly, all Australian Christian Church policies approved by its national conference. The adoption of those policies by affiliated churches will be examined during this hearing. Hillsong was established in 2001, following the merger of Sydney Christian Life Centre and Hills Christian Life Centre. The founding senior, senior pastor of Hillsong is Brian Houston, and as I've indicated, he will give evidence today. Hillsong currently operates churches in 26 locations around Australia, with over 35,000 people attending weekly church services, 5,000 children attending children's programs on a weekly basis and around 2,300 young people aged between 12 and 15 attending youth programs on a weekly basis. Hillsong also operates internationally with churches located in Europe, the USA, the United Kingdom, South America and Africa. Hillsong is self-governing as a separate incorporated legal entity. The Australian Christian Churches has limited oversight over Hillsong, but as an affiliated church, Hillsong is required to adopt appropriate child protection policies and practice guidelines <coughs> consistent with the minimum standards set by the Australian Christian Churches. The nature of these policies and guidelines will be examined during this hearing. Among other matters, Case Study 18 inquired into the experiences of some survivors of child sexual abuse within the Australian Christian churches and affiliated churches. 
This involved an examination of the systems, policies and procedures in place within the institutions for raising and responding to allegations of child sexual abuse. The Royal Commission made a number of findings in relation to the response of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to child sexual abuse. In relation to the Australian Christian Churches, the Royal Commission found that, firstly, in order to be affiliated with the Australian Christian Churches and issued with a certificate of fellowship, the Australian Christian Churches recommended but did not require affiliated churches to adopt and adhere to child protection policies, uh, pastors to adhere to child protection policies and pastors to attend training programs on child protection. It was secondly found that the Australian Christian Church's policy for handling complaints of sexual misconduct against pastors, as outlined in a policy document entitled Grievance Procedure, prioritised the protection of pastors from false accusations over the safety of children by requiring complaints to be in writing to indicate the seriousness of the accusation. It was also found that the Australian Christian Churches did not have in place any process to provide pastoral support or communicate information of a disciplinary process of a minister to a survivor of child sexual abuse in the event that the minister was convicted of sexual offences. Finally, it was found that the Australian Christian Churches did not require a person to have a credential in order to call themselves a pastor in an Australian Christians Church affiliated church. In relation to Hillsong, the Royal Commission found that neither Hillsong nor its predecessor churches reported disciplinary proceedings against an Australian Christian Church's credentialed minister to the New South Wales Commission for Children and Young People, as required under the Act. It was also found that Hillsong did not have a conflict of interest policy that considered familial conflicts of interest, given how common it was for family members to be involved in senior ministry in the church. It was lastly found that the policies and procedures of the Australian Christian Churches in handling allegations of child sexual abuse were not followed at the state level. Today, the Royal Commission is expected to hear that the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong have taken steps to address the findings arising from case study 18. These include making it mandatory rather than optional for affiliated churches to adopt and adhere to child protection policies set by the Australian Christian Churches, a condition that credentialed ministers and pastors are not eligible for renewal if they have not completed child protection training in the last three years, amendments to the grievance procedure to ensure that children <coughs> and persons who have a disability can make a complaint and are provided with assistance to document the complaint. Monitoring of complaints is now a permanent agenda item at both national and state executive meetings. Discouraging the use of the term pastor by those who did not hold the appropriate credential through articles written by the national president and speeches at conferences and events, and amendments to the document entitled Ministerial Code of Conduct to set out expectations of credentialed ministers in handling allegations of sexual abuse, including consequences of a breach and specific reference to conflicts of interest. It is expected that senior representatives of Hillsong will give evidence that the steps taken by Hillsong since case study 18 include, firstly, updating procedures to include disciplinary, termination and external reporting processes when handling allegations of child sexual abuse. Secondly, the development of a conflict of interest procedure 
to enable the risk of actual or perceived conflicts of interest to be managed. Thirdly, enhancing the process <coughs> for staff recruitment with all volunteers working with children in New South Wales required to reapply for their roles through an improved recruitment process. And finally, delivery of training to those in child-related roles and participation in training delivered by the New South Wales Ombudsman. The Royal Commission is expected to hear evidence that both the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong undertook a review of their child protection policies and implemented new strategies to ensure that their institutions are child safe. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that on 1 December 2015, the National Conference of the Australian Christian Churches implemented a safer churches strategy to enhance their approach towards child protection. A central part of that strategy is the adoption of a national child protection policy, which applies a minimum standard of child protection that must be adopted by all affiliate church, affiliated churches. Other components of that strategy include a national helpline, known as a Safer Churches Helpline, operated by an external organisation to receive concerns about abuse, a one-day mandatory Safer Churches awareness workshop for Australian Christian churches, ministers and pastors based on the National Child Protection Policy and Safer Church Guidelines, the appointment of state and local Safer Churches officers to ensure the implementation of the National Child Protection Policy, the creation of a National Safer Churches panel that meets regularly and is attended by all state Safer Churches officers to review policies and make recommendations to the national executive, and the availability of Safer Churches resources to all affiliated churches, which include guidelines, an implementation kit, an awareness workshop manual, and a volunteer code of conduct. The Royal Commission will also hear evidence that since case study 18, Hillsong has undertaken a review of its own child protection policy and procedures and has adopted policies consistent with the national child protection policy. The Royal Commission will hear that in March 2016, the Hillsong Board of Directors adopted the Safe Church policy, which created four new roles for child protection and overall church safety being the Safe Church Office, Head of Safe Church Officer, Head of Agency and Investigators. The Safe Church Office and Head of the Office is responsible for handling disclosures of child sexual abuse, including investigating and reporting to regulatory agencies. The Head of Agency and Investigators investigate and make findings of reportable conduct pursuant to Hillsong's responsibilities under the Ombudsman Act 1974 in New South Wales. The Safe Church policy is supported by a range of interconnected policies, procedures, codes of conduct and manuals known as the Safe Church Framework. The Royal Commission will hear that one such manual the Safe Church Training Manual, was adopted by Hillsong to provide training to all staff and volunteers to enable the effective implementation of the Safe Church Framework. The Royal Commission is expected to hear that the Safe Church Policy and the Safe Church Framework exceed the minimum standard set by the Australian Christian Church's National Child Protection Policy. In July 2016, the Royal Commission published 10 elements which should be present in a child safe institution. Those elements are, first, child safety is embedded in institutional leadership, governance and culture. Second, children participate in decisions affecting them and are taken seriously. Thirdly, families and communities are informed and involved. 
Fifthly, equity is promoted and diversity respected. Sixthly, people working with children are suitable and supported. Seventhly, processes to respond to complaints of child sexual abuse are child focused. Eighthly, staff are equipped with the knowledge, skills and awareness to keep children safe through continual education and training. Ninthly, physical and online environments minimise the opportunity for abuse to occur. Implementation of child safe standards are continuously reviewed and improved. And finally, policies and procedures document how the institution is child safe. The Royal Commission is expected to hear evidence that through the adoption of the Safer <coughs> Churches strategy by the Australian Christian Churches and the Safe Church Framework by Hillsong, both the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong are largely compliant with the child safe organisation elements. It is also expected that during the hearing, the Royal Commission will hear evidence that the Australian Christian Churches strongly supports and promotes providing all necessary and appropriate care for survivors of abuse, but that it is limited in its ability to enforce any policies and procedures on local churches with respect to financial redress, and that each local church must consider its own approach to financial redress. Senior representatives of Hillsong are expected to give evidence that while the board of directors are committed to a caring and appropriate response to victims of abuse, it is yet to finalise its position on redress. On 4 November 2016, the Commonwealth Government announced the Commonwealth Redress Scheme for the survivors of child sexual abuse in institutional contexts. The government has invited states, territories and other non-governmental institutions to join the Commonwealth Scheme. The approach to the scheme by the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong will be explored during this hearing. The Royal Commission also anticipates receiving evidence from Australian Christian communities and Hillsong regarding steps taken in some of the key areas of work undertaken by the Royal Commission. This includes the approach of the Australian Christian Churches and Hillsong to civil litigation, and in particular, whether consideration has been given to model litigant guidelines, mandatory reporting and reportable conduct. I have two volumes of evidence to tender for the purpose of today's hearing. One volume relates to Hillsong and one volume relates to the Australian Christian Churches. We'll make the Hillsong volume Exhibit 55 one and the other one Exhibit 55 two. Would it be convenient to adjourn for five minutes to have the panel of witnesses? Yes, we'll do that. All stand.
Would you say that? The first panel this morning uh, has representatives, two representatives from the Australian Christian Churches. Um, I'll start from uh, right to left with uh, Pastor Wayne Alcorn, Pastor Sean Stanton, and Mr. Peter Barnett, who is from Safe Ministry Resources. Gentlemen, you need to be sworn. Will you all take a note from the Bible? I prefer to do an affirmation. 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 Yes. All of your affirmations. Yes. Would you all stand then for me, please? And together repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall, shall be, be the, truth, the truth, the whole truth, the whole, the whole truth, truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing, nothing but, but the truth. truth. Thank you, Thank you. Yes. I'll start with you, um, Pastor Alcorn. Could you tell the commission your full name, please? Wayne Alexander Alcorn. And you're a pastor of which church? The Australian Christian Churches and of the local church, Hope Centre, in Brisbane. Sorry, in where? Brisbane. Brisbane. You are the current president of the Australian Christian Churches? Yes. And how long have you held that position for? Since April 2009. And what are your key responsibilities in that position? Leadership, the setting of the agenda and the chairing of our national executive, um, and the overall vision, direction and culture of the movement. Pastor Stanton, I'll move to you. Could you tell the Commission your full name, please? Sean Gregory Stanton. And where are you a pastor? In Canberra, Life Unlimited Church. You also hold a role in the Australian Christian Churches at the national level? That's correct, as and National Secretary. And Sorry. for how long have you held that position? Uh, since 2011, May. And what are your key responsibilities in that position? It is to... Um, I guess, outwork the um, vision direction of the movement in the practical areas, organisationally, structurally, uh, addressing policy stuff and procedural stuff. Mr Barnett, I'll move to you. Could you state your full name for the Commission? Peter John Barnett. You work at Safe Ministry Resources? That's right. And how long have you worked there? Safe Ministry Resources was um, started in 2007. I'll come to uh, ask you more about that organisation later during this morning's evidence. I'll direct this question to uh, you, Pastor Alcorn, and you, Pastor Stanton. On the 27th of June 2016, the Australian Christian Church's solicitors sent the Royal Commission a detailed update in relation to development of uh, the Australian Christian Church's child protection policies. I, I take it you're both aware of the content of that document? Yes. yes. And the content of that document is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. yes. Uh, that's the document in tab two of the um, Australian Christian Church's bundle. On the 9th of March this year, the three of you prepared a joint statement, which is now to be found at page five of the Australian Christian Church's tender bundle. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. 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 Pastor Alcorn, could I have you describe to us in a bit more detail, what the Australian Christian Churches is. We're a group of now over a thousand churches formed 80 years ago, once known as the Assemblies of God, now as, as the last few years, a name change, a more contemporary name, the Australian Christian Churches. We 
are in every city, in every state, and in most regional centres. We are a group that has agreed to work together in voluntary cooperation. We also are a group that is varied, multicultural, um, we're urban, we're rural, we're a group that's led by leaders of different ethnic backgrounds, different ages. We also are a group that has agreed to pursue certain objectives, which include uh, missional activities overseas and other particular activities which unite us. We are also a group that, though there are a number of high-profile churches and ministries, we're also a group that is comprised of a lot of churches. More than 70% of us are a group of churches of 200 people or less. And uh, most of those are unincorporated associations, which gives us a very organic feel to who we are and how we operate. We are a, a grassroots up organisation rather than a hierarchical power down organisation. And that brings with it a lot of um, different approaches, different challenges for us as leaders. But uh, I would say that a, a group that is, is very committed to helping people, a group that is, uh, has embraced this challenge wholeheartedly in the area of responding appropriately to child abuse, both protection, prevention and responses. Is the Australian Christian Churches an umbrella organisation or is it, uh, it its own church with its own pastors? We are a, a group of independent churches that are bound together by the credentials of the pastors and by the registration of the churches within the movement. It's not a group that are like some other more traditional churches and denominations that has a, a structure that comes from the top end and flows down. More it's a group that is um, working together in, as I've said earlier, voluntary cooperation. What would you say distinguishes the Australian Christian churches from other Pentecostal movements? We, we have a lot in common with most other Pentecostal denominations and movements. Um, there are really only minor differences perhaps in interpretation of scripture or perhaps structure. Um, I'm not familiar with the inner workings of most of them, though we have a great working relationship with them. And how does a, a church become an affiliate of the Australian Christian churches? Many of them were planted out of an existing church and we have processes of recognition and registration. Some have joined us, having already been established, and there is an application process and certain criteria they have to meet for us to then register them. And if you register them, they become affiliated with Correct. your church? Now, there's a... a, a principle of autonomy that operates within your institution. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Unlike the, um, perhaps some of the more traditional, well-established groups that have been around for even centuries, uh, our groups have, we recognise the right for self-governance. We recognise that uh, each leader has a sense of call to their local church and local community, and we respect that. We also recognise that there is strength in the group. There is strength in us working together. And I've been thrilled to watch the benefits of that working together. I've been thrilled to watch how the culture of our organisation, though they are autonomous, uh, they have seen the benefits of owning certain values, owning certain beliefs, and buying into a culture. And when we gather at a regional, a state or a national event, particularly our conferences, matters of importance are raised and we found that what we have called voluntary cooperation has been quite um, enthusiastic cooperation. Once um, a church affiliates with the Australian Christian Church, does it 
have to renew its affiliation or is it affiliated once and for all? No, it has to regularly continue to be registered. And, and how, how regularly does that occur? I, I believe every second year. Um, my secretary would yeah. probably be better. He handles the administration. Can you assist us, Pastor Stanton? Yeah, the, there's a renewal notice that goes out with uh, national dues, which we just finalise in the return of them at the moment, and that's part of the re-registration every year that they indicate that they have appropriate things in place. Uh, so we've added uh, to the form a child policy, protection policy in place, insurance, various other things that are minimum things that we require each church to have, and that's how they're renewed. And, and just on that point with the child mm. protection policy, is it right that a condition of the, the affiliation or the re-registration of that particular church with you is that they agree to the minimum standards which are set by your child protection policy? Yes, that's correct. Can I move now to asking about how somebody becomes a pastor? Um, it's right that the Australian Christian Churches is responsible for accrediting pastors. Yes. Could I ask you, Pastor Alcorn, to explain to us how that works? It starts with an application which requires a nomination from a senior leader within our group. Usually the local church senior pastor or where it's a brand new church, it's their regional overseer would recommend for nomination a particular man or woman. They would then apply. There are certain criteria that must be met, including theological training, including character references, including the uh, appropriate training in the area of uh, prevention of child abuse, the presentation of the relevant police check state by state, and, uh, and then through the several months that the application process takes part, it, it would then require an interview, usually at a regional event, with uh, a select panel, a credentialing panel, then it would, uh, uh, if that then is endorsed, it would be handed to the state credential committee, who then ratify that and investigate anything further if there's any concerns or questions. And finally, it will arrive at the national executive's table. That is a process that takes many months. And if you accredit that person, that he or she is then allowed to call him or herself a pastor? There are three levels of, of uh, credentialing and the certificates that a, an ACC pastor has. There's the specialised ministry, which are used in the areas of uh, hospital chaplains, etc., because they're specialised ministries. We then have a what we call a PMC, a probationary minister's certificate. At that point, those people are then required to serve a minimum of two years and conduct themselves in a, a manner that is suitable. And uh, again, they're monitored, they're mentored, and then finally, at least two years, oftentimes much longer, they'll get their full OMC. But it is not until they get a PMC that we allow people to call themselves pastor. We recognise that that was an issue that was raised when we appeared in case study 18 and we uh, quickly moved to change the culture and practice within our movement. In what you're saying there, are you referring to the fact that some people were calling themselves pastor, but they weren't in fact accredited by your organisation? Yes, I, I made the point last time that in a biblical context, pastor is a function, not just a title that we bestow, and a pastoral or shepherding responsibility is something that happens. However, we understand that in our community there are assumptions made that are linked to a title. So we've, we've asked, and, and I'm quite happy to report that there's been a real progress, there's been real progress made in areas of uh, churches. I, I don't know of churches where people who don't have at least a PMC are now called pastor. I was just going to ask you this, how can you stop people calling themselves pastor? I'd like you to help me with that. <laughs> but you, you've taken uh, what uh, steps you can. I, I think the, the culture, I think the, the 
continued repetition of this, the lamination of it through various communication. And uh, we, we've, we've certainly addressed it. We've certainly seen incredible progress. Um, I, I can't sit here today and say that you could definitely guarantee 100%. People are inclined to say things oftentimes, uh, you know, without the support of perhaps the organisation. But by and large, I'm confident that it is not a, a significant issue within the ACC. Once you have accredited a pastor, is there a process of renewal or are you accredited once and for all? No, there's a regular renewal process. And I take it part of that renewal process these days involves uh, checking that the pastor is cognizant of and compliant with the child protection policies? Yeah, more than just cognizant, we require we demand that they have done suitable training, that they have adopted our policies, and that they have a current police check relative to the state in which they serve in place. Thank you. You'll be happy to know I'm going to leave you alone for a moment now and move to you, uh, Mr Barnett. I wanted to ask a little bit more about what it is that your organisation, Safe Ministry Resources, does. Yeah, Safe Ministry Resources is just a private company that was started um, in response to uh, requests. I was working at that time in the Baptist Association in New South Wales, and we were working cross-denominationally uh, at an ad hoc level um, in terms of how to, uh, in our training and working together in training. It's where I met Pastor Sean in that day. Um, and uh, from that, we started to get questions about, you know, how do we do response better for smaller groups that don't have the resources of, say, a big uh, denominational structure. So we made a company called Safe Ministry Resources. And, and just to stop yep. there, when you're talking about the response, that's the response to child sexual abuse? Oh, and, and all types of misconduct in the oh, church, okay. across the board. Um, within two years, that the company got to the point where the Baptist Association said to myself, it's time for us to part ways. You take the company name and make a, a company. And since 2009, we've been offering an independent service to Christian organisations in the areas of prevention, responding and recovery in terms of misconduct and abuse in the church. And you've, in fact, provided services to the Uniting Church, to various dioceses of the Anglican Church and so on. The Salvation Army, Baptist, um, Seventh-day Adventists. So how did you come to be involved with the Australian Christian churches? As I mentioned, back in, I think it was 2006, um, at a state level working on, on child protection training cross-denominationally, um, Pastor Sean and I met uh, through a, a friend and a colleague and we started to develop the New South Wales training package for uh, child protection that was then rolled out from 2007, I think we said, Sean. Um, so then fast forward to after they'd come to you in uh, 2014 and responded with a child protection policy at their national conference, then asked the question how, they, how are they going to write their guidelines um, and their training to go along with the policy for child protection. And I was approached by, uh, really through connections with Sean, approached um, by the movement to sit with them and work through the uh, best practice, good practice guidelines and training and implementation. Uh, so if I can put it in a nutshell, you've provided expert assistance to Australian Christian churches in developing their child protection policy and framework. Yes, that's right. Just while I've got you, is it right that you subsequently provided assistance to Hillsong Church in developing its uh, child protection framework? That is correct. And that was after you had provided assistance to the Australian Christian churches? That is correct. Pastor Alcorn, if I can return to you, what were the key lessons learned from <coughs> Case Study 18 so far as Australian Christian churches was concerned? There were many. And we did a lot of soul searching. I along with our leadership, have watched the Royal Commission with keen interest and uh, have learned not only from our case study but from others. And 
I think, in a nutshell, we needed to enhance our culture of responsibility. We took on board the uh, the vital issue of mandatory reporting, though some state legislation, as it was at the time, didn't require it. We require it. We adopted the uh, the the policy in principle of no one without a certain level of credential could be called pastor. We we respect that. It creates a sense of security and authority for a parent when they brought their, their child or young person to a, uh, an event or a gathering, that for somebody to carry a certain title, it brought with it certain responsibilities and training and endorsements from a group like us. We, we realised that many things that we were asking of our churches were recommended. Now they're no longer recommended, they're required. And really, that was the primary thing, which really was the domino which flowed through the entire movement. This is no longer optional. There are minimum standards, and we require them. And we also learned that though for, in our understanding at the time, natural justice required a written statement when a complaint was made, we realised that that's not always easy. We realised that for various reasons people couldn't initially write their complaint. So we've put in processes, ways to assist the uh, the victims. At the time, uh, when, they, when they first come forward, we obviously do need to document things for proper record keeping and uh, for, for administration and to refer it to it as, as things unfold. But we realised and recognised that it, it did seem harsh. It did seem as though we were a little too clinical in requiring initially a written statement. And so we've, we've moved from uh, an organisation where there were certain things that were accepted within the, the fabric of our movement, which were required, and, which were, sorry, recommended, which were we, we felt were good, but with the, the learnings that have come out of Case Study 18, we've certainly taken things to a, a much higher standard and where there's far less room for, for things to be missed, for there to be any level of irresponsibility carried by leadership within local churches. Uh, what about in relation to governance issues? And I'll draw your particular attention to questions of conflicts of interest. Any mm -hmm. lessons learned there? Yes. We, we've made changes to our policies around code of, uh, code of conduct for pastors. We, we had uh, covered it, but only in certain areas within the life of a pastor, and it was particularly in the area of uh, financial handlings. Now it, it covers all areas. You mentioned that one of the learnings you took away was that it was better to require rather than to recommend. How, what mechanism do you use to require your affiliates to comply with your policies? Uh, I'll, I'll, if I may initially answer that, and then uh, Pastor Sean Stanton mm. handles the administration from with, from the national office. Quite simply, if you want to remain a pastor at any level within the Australian Christian Churches, or you want your church to remain affiliated with us, there is no option other than to accept our policy and our work. Them. So it's a condition of accreditation. I'll ask that. To, uh, yes, it is, Pastor Stanton. Yeah. That's correct. Like I said a bit earlier, the church, uh, when its dues are paid, uh, there's a form filled in and they are required to fill in, signed off by the senior pastor of that church or their appointee to say that the board has adopted the child protection policy, has engaged in training and implementation of it as one of the conditions of the church being re-registered. With our credentialed pastors, they uh, are, their renewal is every two years, um, unless they choose an annual one, but mostly it's every two years. And again, that they've got to say what course they went to when they did it and attach any documentation like 
from the ACT, working with vulnerable children, or whatever it is that's required within that state, um, has to be attached to, in order for a renewal to take place. So, Pastor Stanton, when you changed your uh, settings and started to require affiliated churches yeah. to comply with your child protection policy and started to require pastors to comply with your relevant policies. Did you receive any pushback from the affiliates or from the pastors? No, I'd say that um, because of the way we explained it, presented it at the national conference, that this would be a requirement. And those changes both to the confidentiality uh, in the uh, code of conduct to the, the areas around the failure to report or handle a, a matter properly were all unanimously passed, including the endorsement of the, uh, the policy and then the procedural documents. Um, and we've just found an incredible take-up. Uh, there were a number of states that were really working with Safer Ministries resource, New South Wales, Victoria, and a lot of training had been done there already. But since then, uh, there's over 7,700 people we've trained in the last 16 months. So I would say there's an enthusiastic response. And Mr Barnett, I see you nodding over there. Did you want to add something? No, it's just an exciting story, really. So, yes. yeah. It's one thing to require your affiliates to comply with your child protection policies, but do you do anything to check that they actually are? Is there any kind of audit process or anything like that? Well, I get, the, the audit is at the point of renewal and the documentation. Um, we don't really have the resource to order churches, but between our state, regional and national leaders, we, across the board, we visit a lot of churches at different times, and there are conversations, awareness, and it becomes clear that people have or haven't, and we found that people have engaged. Occasionally, there's been questions around clarity. What do we do about this? And then we... If I can answer it, I do it while I direct them back to Safe Ministries resource. Would I be correct in understanding there is no formal audit process to see if your affiliates are, in fact, complying no, with these that's policies? that's correct, yeah. Do you think there may be room for the adoption of any kind of audit or review process in the future? I think we could uh, look at it. The gain would come down to uh, an ability to resource that uh, would be the challenge for us. On that front, um, Pastor Stanton, uh, one of the compliance mechanisms informally is insurance, yes. namely that the insurer will require yes, uh, that's correct. compliance. Um, have, has your organisation a common insurance insurer or is that a matter for each individual church? Um, it is a matter for each individual church, but we do have an insurance um, uh, ACS, uh, Australian Christian Financial Services, and they provide insurance to the vast majority of our churches, and in their form for the insurance renewal, there's quite a bit of attention given to these issues, answering them, and I got a report that uh, this year with the annual renewal, there were only eight churches that didn't sign off that that actually implemented a policy. Uh, they've been all followed up, and some of them were uh, churches where the English was not the first language. One or two actually had misunderstood the question and actually had implemented, but then we work with them uh, in order to, otherwise the insurance isn't in place, and we won't uh, accredit that church. And to date, has your insurer taken an interest in your child protection work? Absolutely, yes. Who is your insurer? Um, well, it's through Australian Christian Services, ACS. But we do have some churches that insure with other entities because they're not compelled to insure through us. I'll take you to some documents now. If I could start with uh, the document at tab six, please, in the uh, Australian Christian Churches Bundle.
Now, Pastor Alcorn, this is, you'd be familiar with this as your organisation's child protection policy. Yes. And this is the, the starting point when we want to understand how this policy works. Yes. So this is the entry point into the policy. Yes. Can I take you to pinpoint 0011 as part of that policy? right up the top, but there's a statement there. We expect ACC people to put the rights of a child or young person to the protection from harm ahead of any cultural and religious practices of families. That, that's a very powerful statement of your commitment to child protection, isn't it? It is. And what motivated you to put that statement into there? Our desire to ensure that all children are safe in any church or ministry that we present. If I can take you now to tab seven, what should come up are the ACC Safer Churches Guidelines. Is it right that these guidelines help people or help your affiliates to understand how to implement the child protection policy? Yes, it is. And if I can take you to pinpoint 0017. At the bottom of that page, there's a heading process for reporting. So you, you do set out a clear process in your guidelines for how concerns about child sexual abuse can be yes. reported through your organisation. Could I then take you to uh, 0019 of that guideline? See down at 11, responding to conflicts. Your, your organisation chose to deal expressly with the question of conflicts of interest yes. in handling child sexual abuse allegations. Yes. If I can take you now to tab 8. This is the Australian Christian Church's implementation kit. This is the, the, the kit, I gather, that you send out to all of your affiliated churches, which shows them in a nutshell what your minimum standards are yes. and how they need to be implemented. Yes. And if I could take you to... Could I take you to pinpoint 0056? Or in fact, over, I, I beg your pardon, to 0057. You actually provide a checklist for your affiliated churches as to how they will go about ensuring that they've implemented each aspect of your yes. child protection policy. It's been very helpful for churches too. It, it, it means that they're not missing the important factors in the whole process. Because you've collected it all together in that checklist for them. Correct. If I can take you now to pinpoint uh, 0070. One of the documents that sits in the implementation kit is a ministerial code of conduct. And that's what I'm showing you now. And this is where you set out your expectations of pastors within your churches. Yes. And if I can take you to 0073. 
down the bottom of that page, you expressly deal with the idea of conflict of interest in your ministerial code of conduct. Yes. A and was that because of lessons learned in case study 18? It was. Now, you also have a grievance procedure, which I'd like to ask you about. If we can go to 00... zero. Oh. Yes. I'll... It's a, a lot of these documents are repeated twice through the tender bundle. I'll take you to its iteration at tab 20. So if, if you go to 0268, what, what you've done here is commit to paper the various steps in handling a complaint. Yes. Now, it's right that following from case study 18, you changed your approach to make it easier for a complaint to be made under your grievance handling policy. Yes, we have. How did you do that? Through a process of consultation, through lessons learned from this commission and through engaging with an independent group, uh, such as SMR. We, we recognised that the perception was that it was not necessarily child-friendly. Our intent was never to be that way, though that's how it appeared. We, we reviewed it from a, a position of a child going forward rather than from a leader going down, if, if that is clear. We, we looked at it from the perspective of a complaint being made that required uh, support right through. We also recognised that, that up until this review and the changes that we've made, that a lot of what we were doing was, though different components of the Australian Christian churches were dealing with it, it did appear, and frankly, it, it often was, fully uh, responded to from within the framework of our own movement. So to inquire uh, or require the help of external parties, such as uh, a ministry like SMR, has really helped. The big changes were uh, mandatory reporting required no matter what state legislation said. The big changes were independent support, the 1800 helpline, which instantly means that the local pastor, perhaps even in a smaller or rural setting, uh, doesn't have to be an expert. They can call on people who really do have expertise in this field. And the other one was to support survivors of ch uh, child abuse in the way that it is often, we recognised, often traumatic for them to have to write the complaint. We actually realised that for various reasons that wouldn't be possible it, with the initial contact and initial complaint. So we've, we've made it far uh, easier for us to deal quicker with issues that arise. I just want to follow up on two aspects of the evidence you just gave. First of all, you mentioned that you have established an independent helpline, and I'll, I'll just show you the document at tab 16. So what, what's the idea behind this helpline? Uh, I'm going to let Sean and Peter, if they... I would they say better. there's two primary things. One, that anybody in any church, and these are on display, that has a query can phone, and they're not dealing with anybody from that church or even from our organisation. So we recognise that, the, whether it's real or not, that there can be a perception, well, you... Um, looking after yourselves, it's peers making assessments. We now have somebody totally independent making an assessment, giving advice and then, and as to who they should report to or reporting, and then the information comes back to us. Um, it also allows for our pastors and other workers uh, in church styles, if they've got a query, they can phone it as well, even though every church is encouraged to have a safer churches officer. So just to clarify, the 
helpline is independent of the totally. ACC. Yeah. Who, who runs the helpline? The Safe and Ministries Resource. But you pay for the helpline? Yep. And this document that I've shown you appears to be a, a, a brochure. Is this something that's widely disseminated amongst your affiliate members? It, it is, it's, and it's also part of the training. When they do the, the training, uh, they've informed about it and encouraged to place it around the church building at different places. Um, and most churches I go to, I see it displayed somewhere, and particularly with children, I've been signed in for programs, you know, kids' church, that sort of thing on a Sunday. Pastor Alcorn, another thing you mentioned when we were talking about the improvements that had been made to the complaint handling process was the provision of independent support to the complainant. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, well, from within the ACC, each church, we ask them to have a, uh, a person responsible for child protection who then works with SMR and, the, and other authorities to, uh, to process the, uh, the complaint. We do rely heavily on SMR for, for independent support. Uh, and that's Safe Ministry yes. Resources, which yes. is uh, Mr Barnett's organisation. Yes. Could I take you now to another uh, document which is found at tab 9? This is a Safer Churches manual. Uh, Reverend Stanton, I, I beg your pardon, Pastor Stanton, I'll direct this to you. Is this basically the how-to guide that you give to your affiliate yes, churches? that's correct. So that... this, this is where they go <coughs> if they want to understand what their obligations are. That is correct. Are. Could I take you to uh, pinpoint 0101? There, you, you, this manual sets out a, a detailed overview on understanding abuse. And if we go over to, say, pinpoint 0104, you look at the definitions and types and indicators of, of child abuse. And if you go over to pinpoint 01, 06, you set out a series of indicators of child sexual abuse. H have you had any feedback from your affiliate churches or pastors as to whether they find this level of detail to be of assistance to them? Uh, yes, we have had feedback on that. And I think it's important to mention that while this manual is available uh, to our pastors and churches, the place where they uh, would actually work through it is in one of the workshops where there is both group learning and interaction and questions and answers um, uh, and that day training, which is uh, quite significant. Uh, and so they become more familiar with it in that way rather than just, oh, there was a manual on a shelf. That, uh, the manual's there, but the workshop works around all of this and in, in bringing them a heightened awareness to it. I would add that it, it's actually helped our pastors and leaders be far more aware yeah. of the why behind certain behaviour, mm -hmm. and we can often help a child before things um, deteriorate in their situation. Yes, and, and if I can take you to 0 0.108 of this document, the manual, if I can have that enlarged, provides a fairly detailed description of grooming, mm. for example, to assist people in spotting that. Then if we go over to uh, 0113, your manual sets out mandatory reporting requirements in each state because, of course, your organisation operates nationwide. So 
you've, you've set out in your manual what the mandatory reporting requirements are in each state. And then if we take New South Wales for an example, if I can have that enlarged, you, you actually provide the telephone numbers that people need to contact. Have you had any feedback from your affiliates about whether they regard this as helpful? Yes, they have, because that's one of the, I think, the challenges is that there is no standardised thing across all states. And, in fact, uh, the President wrote to the Attorney Generals of all states and the federal requesting that there could be some standardisation. But because there isn't, we provide this. And in each state where the training takes place, it's, it's highlighted for their state and there's a flow chart as well that helps them make the decision. Yes. Because, I, indeed, I think in New South Wales it's the case that clergy are not mandatory reporters, although your policy is that your clergy... We require them. That's correct. Um, added to that, uh, Mr Barnett, do you regard your helpline service as a mandatory reporting mechanism? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So what do you do if you receive a, a report of child sexual abuse? So that when we receive that report, we uh, work with the person who has reported, which is most likely, most often, uh, either a pastor or a children's worker, and we work through them, uh, take them to part of the manual. They make that report. We, we will then ring them back. Or conf <coughs> when we send it to the state safer churches officer, they will work through that that mandatory report has been done. And so there's a triangle, I guess, of safety there. And roughly speaking, how many reports do you get, say, in a month? Um, the, uh, I've got a year figures um, and there's a, one of the tabs is actually our quarterly report to uh, the Australian Christian Churches but I haven't committed those to, to memory but roughly, um, well over the year of 2016 uh, there were um, 76 I believe child protection related reports from the ACC to the, the helpline uh, not all of those were mandatory reporting issues, uh, thresholds, different states um, so that was it. that was in the year. Uh, to, if it assists, uh, Mr. Barnett, I'll have you show in tab twenty four, which is just for one quarter, I believe. Yes, this is the. I'll just have you confirm. This is the quarterly report you provide to Australian Christian churches. I, we might have that to the national executive. Yes, and then if, if we can scroll to the bottom half, you provide a, a breakdown of how many reports were made and, and which states they were coming from. And if I can add to that, um, just th those, are, those numbers there are safe church, not just child protection. So they might have to do with adult to adult misconduct, work health and safety issues around bullying or harassment, um, spiritual abuse between adults as well as implementation questions and that's been what has been quite uh, an exciting part of this helpline. It's not just that it's been a response helpline but the churches, as they have been implementing the guidelines, they'll ring and they'll say, look, we're just asking questions about supervision numbers or, you know, your guideline says this, how do we do that? So they are all the calls both in terms of response and implementation. If I can just show you pinpoint 0493, the next page of that document. You also, in that quarterly report, break down the, the types of calls that you've received, what, what they relate to. That's correct. We've looked in detail at the manual. Well, just so everyone knows <coughs> who's listening, that shows eight reports of child-related sexual assault. In that quarter? Yeah. Doesn't break them down by state, though, does it? Uh, no, but we do have that information. And each state, each month, before, before the... Um, for the National Executive Reporting, is given our um, monthly report so that the State Safer Churches Officer is making sure they're following on appropriately with appropriate actions as per the procedure in terms of those call the, the, the uh, cases in their state at that time. Would well, the numbers and the breakdown of those numbers there be typical of a quarter? Quite typical, within a range of a few percent, yes. So you're dealing in about... 150, 160 matters of varying types in a year. There was 187 calls 187. from ACC in 2016. Oh. We've spoken about the uh, manual. Now can I turn to ask you some questions about training and 
workshops. Who, uh, uh, Pastor Stanton, should I direct that question to you? I think initially, and then uh, Mr. Barnett would be better to do it. Um, because of the state-based nature of the organisation, uh, our, our movement, we have asked um, Safer Ministries Resource to train trainers in each state. They supervise that, they approve them, they uh, do quality control on it, and so and the reasons for it, rather than just have them doing it all for us, is we wanted to add to the depth of knowledge within our movement, have more people who are across everything and we've got an outstanding group of trainers now available in every single state who continue to do workshops and it's also just the practice of covering uh, regional city things and we with the training we if there is an SMR safe ministries resource training being provided by another denomination in a state we advertise that as well and that helps particularly in regional areas and then they just take them aside and do the specifics related to our movement, but the rest of the training, I think... Yes, did uh, you want to add to that, Mr Barnett? I think that was a very good um, picture of it. The training itself, being safe church training, uh, has covers a broad range of topics, uh, not just child protection topics, but it does provide um, very much a, a duty of care and safety framework for protecting people and, of course, any vulnerable person, including children, um, but there is a significant, uh, um, in the ACC manual, you'll notice that the, the ACC child protection policy is actually included and is referred to throughout the day, so there's, no one leaves that training uh, without understanding the policy and all the guidelines. And exactly whom has to undertake this training? So it's, it's really, if you look at the, um, the recommendations, there's some that were uh, legal or uh, considered to be um, biblically or ethically, you shall do this, and that's for all uh, your credentialed pastors. But then it's recommended for any leaders um, in ACC. So some some groups have actually trained, or anyone who works with anybody in this in this way. Would that be right, Pastor Sean? Yeah. May I answer that, uh, my hat on as a local pastor, that in our, our church we run them uh, at least once a year or partner with one of the other congregations in the city, uh, promote it. It's all our pastors, it's all of our staff, it's all of our key leaders that lead you know, as volunteers, and it's anybody that works with children or young adults, or, or youth, sorry, not, and they are required to do to attend training. With them, um, when the, the various local churches or the affiliate churches decide that they'll uh, do this training with your organisation, Mr Barnett, who pays for it? Is it the local church or does the Australian Christian churches pay for that training? Um, it's twofold. We have levied uh, all our pastors an extra amount, $10 a year as part of their credential renewal, which is the amount to cover basic training, the $30 that is charged, um, because we expect them to renew their training every three years or to do a refresher. And obviously, that's coming up, having just started it now. So we make provision for it there to fund it. And if you remember, I mentioned that it's our... Uh, trainers that have been trained by SMO that uh, do the training. So most of them just do it on a volunteer basis and it's to cover costs, travel, accommodation, whatever it may be. And then the local church usually pays for the however many additional people are being trained. Uh, on to another topic now. It's right that um, the Australian Christian churches now carefully monitors complaints that have been made against uh, pastors. Yes. And is it right that that's become a permanent agenda item in both your state executive and national executive? Yes, it, it is. Uh, it's, it's on every agenda for every meeting. Most states would meet three or four times a year, the national executive likewise. Uh, there are also... Um, other informal gatherings and monitoring by state child protection, child safe officers that are continued to keep us informed. But as a formal, documented, minuted meeting, it's on every state and national executive meeting agenda. Do you want to add anything to that, Mr. Bannon? No. One of the lessons.
lessons, uh, Pastor Alcorn, that you said you took away from case study 18 related to conflicts of interest in managing uh, allegations of child sexual abuse? Now, your organisation has developed an official conflicts of interest policy, hasn't it? Yes. Could I just show you that document at tab 22? Just take you to pinpoint 0281. And I'll have that the, the bottom half of that enlarged. You do expressly deal with the question of relational conflicts of interest. Yes. And, and we may take it that was dealt with by reason of some of the factual circumstances in case study. 18. Yes, it highlighted, and uh, we've responded accordingly. Can I take you to tab two of this bundle? Point zero 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 six. And I'll just, there's a heading for bottom half, redress policies and procedures. And right under that heading, it's stated that the ACC strongly supports and promotes providing all necessary and appropriate care for survivors of all forms of abuse. However, as an organisation, ACC is limited in its jurisdictional ability to enforce any policies or procedures on local churches with regard to financial redress. What, what if anything, has the ACC tried to do about the question of redress? We've uh, accepted every invitation to uh, community roundtables and been actively involved in the, the consultation around redress. We've acknowledged that all of us can do many things and uh, quick response, um, support of survivors of child sex abuse. Those issues have not been questioned or rejected at any level. Very keen, want to help. The issue as it's raised there regarding the finances of uh, local churches, I said earlier, over 70% of our churches have less than 200 people in them. Many of them have very limited, if any, uh, resources. Few of them even have their own properties. Many of them meet and worship in local halls, schools, etc. So their capacity to contribute or commit to contributing to a national scheme on the area of finances is one that is, is in question and more in question simply because at this point in time we don't have any clarity about what it actually looks like. We in principle believe that survivors of child sex abuse should be supported. The question simply is, once we get clarity, we can then take this conversation forward and we, we would have to acknowledge the fact that we are a group where a lot of these are unincorporated associations, they're small, and they're, we would need to be able to work together in continued community consultation to find out how we could do it. So our heart is towards the, the survivors. It's just a matter of our capacity, given what our constituency looks like. Uh, you, you have touched upon the question of the Commonwealth redress scheme. That, that's what I was going to ask you about. Next, um, are you able to indicate what the attitude of your affiliate churches may be, or what, what are you hearing around the traps about? I'm hearing quite a lot of misunderstanding as to what it looks like. 
and how we could actually commit. The pastoral response, as I said, is without question. The, the direct ministry support and, and all that can go for them in, in their, as a person, without question. I think there is genuine concern at most levels of the ACC, particularly on the ground, of a, of a small local church. Many of these pastors are, are part-time on, on small wages themselves, and they are deeply concerned about what this may mean and how they could actually contribute financially. It, in principle, is still something we're very open to continuing to be part of round tables. We're genuinely open to community consultation. Uh, the, when we were invited to the round tables, we were invited amongst a group of, of community organisations. Hence, I assume that the Commission has understandings to the fabric of what our of our movement, and so uh, it really it's it's in that entire bundle that we would have to say our our people are trying to respond. Are we open to it? Absolutely. How it would look and how they would respond is is probably the area that concerns a lot of churches. Uh, the Royal Commission at the time of um, making recommendations about a redress scheme also made recommendations about the conduct of <coughs> civil litigation. And one of those recommendations related to entities identifying a, a proper defendant to be sued in claims of child sexual abuse. Now, you've mentioned that a number of your affiliate churches are quite small. They're often unincorporated associations. Has any work been done by the ACC in relation to who the proper defendant may be in the context of civil litigation? I'm not aware of much. Maybe Sean could help me there. Uh, I think it would be identified through the insurer, is in part, um, as to who the policy is taken out, because every church has to have a, uh, a policy, and I'm not uh, wanting to make the redress issue purely about insurance. We understand that can be very difficult for survivors, um, but that would be the way we would help identify the responsible person or persons. I, I would would add that we are we've not discussed this at length, but we will certainly take it on board and uh, and pursue this matter further. We've touched upon this, but I'll, I'll just confirm that there are obviously differences in the mandatory reporting schemes across yes. the states and territories in which your organisation operates. Does your organisation support uniformity in a mandatory reporting? Y yes, it does. And, and why is that? Because we are a national organisation and pastors move between states. And the more things are uniform across our nation, the easier it is to keep things streamlined and for us to administer processes and schemes. Does your organisation have an approach to reporting historical allegations of child sexual abuse? Yes. What, what's that? Uh, we do report. And um, even if the survivor has requested not to or doesn't want to make a statement uh, or go themselves, and obviously we offer assistance there, we still report. And that was a learning we took from the Commission. So you report the name of the survivor, even if they don't want it reported? Could you, uh, that would come down to the state legislation, what's required. So that if we look at, um, say, sections 316 of the Crimes Act in New South Wales, a New South Wales church rings in, we've got a form that is an NGO form that the police have given us, where they actually say, do you, you know, do, does the um, victim of the crime want to be contacted by the police? Have they been informed of this? So it's a really a case-by-case -case scenario and always our first um, discussion with the survivor is, look, there may be things that this, this church or this pastor has to do under their policy, but when it comes to uh, the court process, you know, you'll be asked, do you want to make a, a statement? So 
in states where um, there, are, there are no laws like that of concealment laws, say in Western Australia, um, Crime Stoppers is often used, um, and so we don't need a lot of information, but the, the, the policy, particularly for ACC uh, credential pastors now through their code of conduct, is that even where there are not mandatory reporting requirements, there will be a report made. So it's setting a high bar because of the high bar set, set in, say, the New South Wales legislation where we have things to consider, like the Ombudsman, what we, you know, the Office of the Children's Guardian, um, Section 316 of the Crimes Act, uh, so let's set the bar at that, that high level, even for our pastors in Tasmania or South Australia or anywhere else. Michelle, do you need time for a morning adjournment or do we need time for a morning adjournment? I've, I've had about five more minutes of questions. It's matter of fact. Does anyone else have any questions? No, I have I don't questions. Have I think we'll take the morning adjournment. Okay. <laughs>
Mr Barnett, you may best be able to assist me with this. Is the reportable conduct scheme in New South Wales applicable to Australian Christian churches? Uh, that's a question um, that is really about the individual local church because of the legislation or the advice from the, uh, the Solicitor General in 2014 around resident, uh, substitute residential care, um, which means that some of our some of the Australian Christian churches or some churches in New South Wales will come under the scheme. Other churches won't, depending on, on whether they are deemed to be an agency. So it's not a blanket, um, a ban blanket policy, you know, a blanket uh, legislative where, where all churches are in. So what we do is we help a church answer that question. To do that specifically, um, in 2015, uh, my company worked with the New South Wales Ombudsman in communicating to churches. We came up with some very specific, this is what it would mean if you are in and how to respond. And so when a church calls, we make sure that if, they're, if they are under the uh, jurisdiction of the Ombudsman, that they comply with that legislation. Pastor Alcorn, you're familiar with the Royal Commission's uh, work and the uh, 10 elements of a child safe organisation? Yes. Do you believe that the Australian Christian Churches is a child safe organisation? Yes, I do, though we are continually under review and want to continue to improve it. Well, indeed, that's the process of continuous review is one of the elements of exactly. the child safe organisation. Do you think in the um, suite of child protection policies you have developed for your affiliates, you have assisted those affiliates to become child safe organisations? Yes, I do. One issue that has emerged in other churches, and it may have emerged in you, is the question of what to do with perpetrators of child sexual abuse or people in respect of whom serious concerns are held if they wish to continue participating in the life of the church. Has your organisation developed any policy around that or any risk management or safe ministry procedures? It is our preference that people who have been found guilty of child abuse, and in particular child sexual abuse, don't worship in, in any setting where children and young people are. And in fact, we've identified some places there where in cities and, and key regional areas, there are places where perpetrators of such crime can actually find a place for uh, worship, personal ministry, etc. Our preference is that they're not in areas where, where children and young people are. Do you have any formal policy around that? There is within the manual uh, provision or guidelines for that if you were to implement it. Um, but again, uh, we encourage them not to attend services because it, even with the best of intentions, keeping people monitored the whole time in every single situation, uh, I think can be difficult. And again, just speaking as a local church pastor, we faced something like this recently. We said to the person they could attend a men's group midweek off campus uh, where there were no children around. So in seeking to be redemptive and to help them in that way, but not permitted on the premises where there are children. Are you aware that the Anglican Church of Australia has done a considerable amount of work in relation to risk management policies for these people? Yes. Uh, and you're aware of that too, Mr Barnett? Yes, SMR also uh, provides professional standards um, services to a number of Anglican dioceses. And if I could add just a, a practice um, in terms of 
some of the helpline questions we have had come in have been about known offenders and actually working with uh, the local church board in providing that good practice advice to local church boards based on the work of the cross-denominational work is what we've done at a practice level for the ACC churches that have asked where the board says we, we really would like some guidance. So we are using the principles that we've developed since really 2005 across denominationally. One last question. Your organisation operates nationally. You'd be aware that the working with children <coughs> check schemes work quite differently in each state and territory. Do you have any observations about whether it would be preferable to have a nationally consistent scheme? It definitely would be preferable. Again, as I mentioned this in October 2014, that it, it just takes another variable out of this important area, and that is different standards, different legislation, different checks for an organisation such as us, which is national, where people do move state to state, to be able to keep the process and the responses uniform, a national standard, national guidelines, national legislation really would help us. And, and because of that, I have written to the Attorneys General of states, territories and federally and requested that that be a consideration. I have no further questions. Yes, um, Mr Murray. Yeah. Um, could I just go back a little bit in relation to questioning about the accreditation of pastors? Um, you'd be aware, if you've been following the uh, hearings in the last few weeks, that one of the issues is about the development of human sexuality within those that propose to be ordained as priests or appointed as ministers. When you accredit a pastor, to what extent do you expect or do seek to understand the level of training that a potential pastor has in relation to issues of human sexuality as it would apply in his or her ministry. And because it's all relevant to do the child protection maths we've been dealing with, but it goes to the nature and character and the formation and training of that individual. So as part of your process, is that something that you would seek to ascertain that they've actually had adequate training in that area? We, yes. We have, obviously we have, uh, theological position on that, of which uh, human sexuality is, is addressed. But further to that, we've developed position papers on human sexuality and uh, made available and required reading for all of our pastors. And so, yes, that is very much part of the forming of, of their worldview as a pastor within our movement. When you say you've, you've got a theological underpinning, if you go to your own um, code of conduct, in a, in a summarised term, you talk about, without putting the document up on the screen, you talk about ministers must value the gift of sexuality by maintaining chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. Yes. And that's a, a very, you know, small way of saying a very great deal. Uh, but are you satisfied that pastors coming into your churches, in fact, have a full and thorough understanding of issues of human sexuality, informed by recent research and understanding, not just the theological position, but also a, a more detailed understanding of the issues that uh, um, we've found to be a risk factor in a number of the churches where that, that uh, developed understanding has not been present. I personally believe we could do more and uh, would happily take that on. We, we certainly, we address that, we monitor that, we, we talk about it freely, and we certainly have ongoing professional development of our, of our people, both men and women. But to ask whether we've done a lot in this area specifically and, and recognised and accredited, I would have to say we haven't done it in, a, in, a, in an intentional way but we certainly would take that on board. So just staying with that theme, you would have heard in the evidence over a number of the case studies, but more recently in the last few weeks, that a number of the religious institutions have in fact introduced um, some sort of testing, be it psychometric testing or other forms of testing with internal or external psychologists or others um, as part of the process to determine whether a person is suitable to be a minister or a priest. Is that part of your accreditation process? 
not at this stage. So how we can look to the fitness of the character of the person by seeking references which you've referred to, but what assurance does anybody have that these people that may have um, predilections in some way, shape or form, or particular attitudes that might be difficult or dangerous, how does the system weed that group out at the earliest stage before they actually become a full-fledged pastor? We would be very reliant on the observation of a person coming through our system over a prolonged period of time from a, an emerging leaders program where there is observation, there's mentoring, there's uh, review of their performance and it, it actually takes many years for most pastors to become ordained with the ACC. So I can't guarantee that that would, in, to use your words, weed out potential predators, but it would certainly give us some confidence that we've got most of that covered. Uh, however, that is a, a discussion point which we've not taken on the, uh, you know, the entire uh, profiling psychologically. So, Pastor Alcon, to your knowledge, do any of the churches, uh, particularly the larger ones, engage in psychological testing or other testing of uh, those that wish to be made a pastor or a minister in their churches? I'm not aware of any anyone formally doing that. But that's something you'd be prepared to look at, given yes. the evidence that's come out in the yes. Royal Commission? Can I, just a related issue, um, um, one that uh, Commissioner Milroy has raised on a number of occasions, in terms of training in relation to children and child development generally, uh, one of the concerns I think the Commission has is people are introducing child protection policies without a thorough understanding of the nature of childhood, childhood development, childhood sexual development. Um, are those matters that are uh, being um, subject to discussion or action by the ACC? Yes, I, I think in my opinion, they are well covered in the training and I don't know whether uh, my colleague, Mr Barnett, would like to speak to that, but I, I think they are and uh, I, I'm comfortable with it, but um, we'd be open to further advice. Uh, that's something certainly in the general safe church training for all leaders is only a small part, but p particularly in our training of children's leaders, uh, that's something we certainly recommend and also have resources for. Particularly when it comes to, if I could just add on that, uh, even um, we've been asked a number of times by leaders and parents for resources on um, what are normal and problematic and even dangerous child uh, um, behaviours in terms of their own development. So, and the third question, the last one, is it in relation to the power imbalance that exists? And again, you would have heard in the inquiries that one of the considerations of the Commission has been the misuse of power. In Catholic and Anglican circles, we talk about clericalism, and in other churches, it's named differently. In your particular churches, the influence of the individual minister, the personality of that minister or pastor, is very pronounced, and congregations are very loyal to yes. a, a particular person, perhaps more so than many of the other churches. Would that be so? It's correct. So the risk, therefore, that can be created by a, a, a very powerful, very influential pastor is as great, if not greater, than it is in the Catholic or Anglican or even Jewish traditions. Would that be true? I'm not sure I would agree with that. I don't know how we measure that. Would, it, would the issue of power and the misuse of power be a significant issue in the training and yes. considerations? And yes. in which way do you deal with that? We deal with it on a number of levels, including the accountability within the local church and within the movement, the observation, the monitoring of the behaviour of particular leaders. We, we do require our board members and senior leadership that have responsibility for not only governance but for the accountability of the senior leadership to be trained in these areas and to watch out for the various signs as laid down in the guidelines. As well as that, the, uh, this issue is, is such a dominant factor in the corporate conversation of the ACC that there is peer mentoring as well as accountability within the system starting at the local church through region, state and national. So it is definitely an issue that I think uh, is one of the areas where people are vulnerable and, and individuals are vulnerable, hence it's something which is high on our radar. Thank you.
Thank you. And my uh, question, firstly, is about um, electronic communication, and uh, two or three, uh, if you wish to respond. Uh, and is it possible to bring up page 20 of um, our initiative for the Safer Churches Manual under that heading, electronic communication? And, and perhaps while that's being done, I'll just uh, read part of the second paragraph. Uh, it's recommended that those working with children, young people and other vulnerable persons follow a set of protocols as well as a statement in the Volunteer Church Workers Code of Conduct as to how leaders will communicate electronically, etc. Um, but is it right that the um, Volunteer um, Church Workers Code of Conduct is, is a single page? Yes. And, and the statement there seems to be, uh, we'll communicate with integrity, including accountable and wise use of electronic communication. Yes. And, and where it references, um, and thank you for bringing it up on the screen, again in paragraph two, a set of protocols, uh, have they actually been developed? Yes, and they are part of the training. Uh, we, we, when we uh, do the, the training that SMR has developed and then we implement those discussions I had about it, it's in that training as well. And as I said earlier, any volunteer who works with children or uh, youth uh, are, in, are required, or in most churches, to actually do the training. So they would explore that, dis discuss it there. And Pastor Stanton, have, have the protocols been documented or is it something that evolves in the training as a discussion? Um, do you know that? In relation to that one, if we could go to page 21, which you were referring to, uh, the next page of the manual, um, there have been various examples given uh, concretely, but impairing it down to what we've seen in responding to uh, situations over the past decade increasingly, um, the main message is we put in some very simple recommendations and, and these are the recommendations for, uh, for, for lay leaders and for all leaders. Um, and you'll note there that the shall part of the guideline, and, and, and the guidelines are broken up into shall and recommend, um, the shall part is actually related to your uh, idea that people who are, even who are a youth leader are in a position of power and trust and therefore we do need to be mindful of that position of trust they hold in their electronic communication. So, and the training focuses on that heavily, that if we ask somebody to represent the church, we're giving them a position of trust that should not be breached, and then how to outwork that. And without any way being critical, and throughout the various documents, it's repeated a number of times, that it's recommended that... Um, uh, in the case of electronic communications with children under 16, this will be done with the full knowledge of the parents or carers of the child or young person. And I just wondered, was there any reason that you um, nominated the age of 16? Uh, again, that has really got to do with the, the varied legislations around Australia and the definition of child and the child protection laws that are all uh, the different jurisdictions use. And that in jurisdictions where uh, a child is a young person at 16 or 17, that they'd be interacting more, and even in a church context, a lot of our leaders are 16 and 17 as a junior leaders or junior helpers. Um, so that was the, the, the idea that in, in every situation, a child is a child until they're 16, then they may be called a, a child or young person. OK, and just find me on this point, uh, just going back to uh, the previous page, um, and I think most people would agree with the words you have there, the explosion of electronic communication. Many people feel that this is an incredibly rapid, rapidly developing area. Um, is there anything that uh, any of the three of you would like to see in terms of further um, material that's available to help with the space or, or further regulation, anything at all that you uh, would like to see uh, added to what's happening now to manage this issue and the safety of children around it? As a broad statement, we'd like help. We would uh, we would like the legislators and all authorities to. We, we'd be very keen to engage in conversations and any workshops or roundtables around this issue, because it is it is something that is prevalent everywhere, not just in churches or any. It, it's everywhere, and uh, we have grave concerns for the the, the what where this could go and so I, I think it is imperative that we, we address it. If the help were to include regulation or legislation, was there anything you had in mind particularly? 
Yes, I'll ask the experts to help me. I, I don't have anything particularly in mind uh, uh, that I could add to that. Yeah. Okay, and, and the, the last one is um, uh, not meant to be unfair, but as things evolve and as you move into the future with your training and your policies and procedures and practices, have, have any of you had a chance to think about how you might go about measuring in terms of performance indicators, either qualitatively or quantitatively, uh, as to uh, uh, assurance of the best that you can that things are working? Well, we've got a, a safer church's offices in each state. They meet regularly. They discuss problems, issues, um, any difficulties they had. Uh, and then we've got a, a national panel that's about to meet with them, with uh, additional experts on it, that will advise and address things. And we will keep that protocol or that in place um, as just part of the process. So there's regular review, talking to those who are dealing with it. And in that context, uh, Safer Ministries resource comes in to report as well. And gets feedback and they can also give us feedback about their experiences in other uh, organisations, church groups that they assist and so together there's some group learning in that and we'll keep that in place. Commissioner, I think a lot of this is quantitative. We can measure and, and uh, you know, tabulate the number of cases reported etc. I also think it's qualitative. Y you can sense the rise in ownership within the culture of our movement. And though we don't want to be broad and nor glib and say, yes, things are getting better, we are under constant review, not just with the, the state uh, coordinators of this important area, but also external experts in the area who I think can help us assess whether, whether our desire is becoming a reality. I'm not sure whether the number of reported cases is the measure. Perhaps we will have more cases reported simply because people trust us more, particularly in the era of reporting historic cases. Um, I do know that one measure is less current cases occurring and being reported, particularly. Um, but I would like to think that we are creating a, a culture and a, a philosophy within our movement where people are feeling more confident that they'll be heard and that they'll be treated appropriately. So um, for me, that's a measure, though it's hard to put a number on it. Oh, yes, I'm not saying it's easy. No. 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 Thank you. Anyone at the bar table? Yes. Thank you. Your Honour, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Barnett, you were, if you recall, you were asked questions about the document that's behind tab 24, and relevantly, the table which appears at zero, uh, point zero four nine three. Can you just have a look at that table again for me, please? Yes. Now, you said that that table was indicative of um, if you expand it across a year, it was indicative of cases with a tolerance of a couple of percent. Is that correct? Correct. And if I look at the table, I see the uh, the number of certain, um, for want of a better word, descriptors. Um, and, the, and the first descriptor is reports of child-related sexual assault. Do you see that? Yes. The number is eight. Yes. Um, that number, without extrapolating across the year, but that number, does that include um, current and historic or historical yes, it does. Uh, in cases? Yes, it does. And does it also include cases being reported from both within the church and the wider community? I would have to say that the wider community's knowledge of the helpline is limited, um, but, but certainly it very much so. If you look at the eight actual eight cases, five, um, five of those eight are about congregational members or family members and have nothing to do with church leadership or hierarchy. So there are reports from leaders who have safe uh, child protection concerns about families in their churches who ring for help from the helpline. So only three of the eight have to do with um, anything to do with um, the church leadership itself or, yeah. And, and of those three, um, do you know if they are current or 
historical from memory? Uh, one was uh, a historical matter of, of a leader, yes. volunteer, lay, lay volunteer. One was a uh, two children, but one was a volunteer. Well, it was a very close in age, but one was a volunteer, so they're both teenagers. Uh, and one was a serious case that was taken by the senior pastor, took his credential pastor straight to the police where the, where the pastor actually made admissions, which led to his immediate um, credential being immediately taken away from him. It was a quite public case. Right. Okay. The, which, uh, which that one, that type haven't been um, regular every quarter. So that was a, if you like, a, a very serious case. Um, this is really a question for... Um, for uh, Pastor Stanton, you were asked questions by Ms Sharp about um, an audit or a formal audit process, and you said there wasn't a formal um, audit process. Can you just explain to the Commission what the role, well, first of all, what is the um, local Safer Churches Officer, the State um, Safer Churches Officer, and what their role is with respect to monitoring both implementation and also perhaps aberrant behaviour? Well, they are known as people that if a church within that state uh, has a situation they can go to them or directly to Safer uh, Ministries resource. And they also are the ones that have been trained to do the training. So many of the volunteer workers and pastors who have attended the training courses <laughs> know that person, so they are quick to go and get advice uh, and that from them. And is there any reporting regime in the context of those two, um, one local and one state um, uh, officers? Are there any reporting, or is there any reporting regime in uh, respect of those officers yeah. and what they have done and what they've seen? Yeah, they have to report up, and, and I think um, Mr Bonnet referred that that becomes part of a report that comes to state and then to national. OK. And finally, on that, on that point, you, the panel was asked a number of questions um, by Commissioner Fitzgerald about um, psychological evaluation and there was a mention of a national panel which was just about to meet mm -hmm. and the inclusion on that panel of, um, I think the description was, additional experts. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe, first of all, can you explain what you mean by additional experts and what their role is on that panel and, sorry, no. just <laughs> one more... Yeah. and um, whether that is in some way addressing some of the concerns expressed by the yeah. uh, Commissioner. Yeah, I think it would. There, there is uh, somebody on there that's worked with what was then DOCS for a long time as a case officer and is a trained psychologist. There is uh, some legal representation there. There are other experts in those fields. I, I wish I could remember their, all their names immediately, but I can't. Um, so it's quite a broad panel of, of seven people. Uh, four of whom are women, and most of them have work in aspects of, of the, this area. And finally, in respect of the uh, creation of the policies that we see um, in the tender bundle, um, was that a <clears throat> strictly internal um, process with SMR, um, or did you actually um, have any consultation process with outside agencies and if so, which agencies? We had uh, external, and there were a number of agencies external to us that we, uh, we only went to external, who um, put a tender forward. That group chose. I actually stayed out of that group uh, because I'd had a prior working relationship back from my role in New South Wales with uh, SMR. And so I felt I should say it and let them come up with who they thought was best. And so what, what, when you say group, you're talking about a group of um, other um, agencies or professionals or... Yeah. Uh, that, can, that you just give me, cool, can you give the Commission an example of who was involved in this consultation process? Or perhaps Mr Barnett could. Yeah, I think... I'm, I don't have the list with me. Um, I know that the... Uh, the um, it was prior to me being involved, so that's a bit yes. hard for me to answer that question. Uh, but from conversations I've had, uh, the Australian Child um, 
Foundation, I think the uh, Child Wise. Correct. Um, there was a number of organisations that worked on the actual child protection policy. And uh, finally, um, uh, Pastor Alcorn, um, I believe you would like to make a very brief statement to the Commission about Thank the you, opportunity that the Commission has given you in the ACC. Thank you. I was here in October 2014, appearing before the Commission, and I recall at the end of my appearance I made a statement that we can do better. I am here today suggesting that we've made a lot of efforts towards that. We would be false in saying that we've got things perfect yet, but we have learned a lot from case study 18 and the months and years that have followed. We now have a framework for us to continue to do better and our work with children and our protection of them and young people and our support of families is an ongoing matter which we commit to continuing to improve in. And I thank you for uh, the engagement that we've had with the Commission and trust that this genuinely will not only uh, help victims of child sexual abuse but actually prevent many more ever happening. Nothing further. Yes, any other questions? <coughs> Uh, nothing arising. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Thank each of you for your contributions, both today and previously. Thank you. Now excused. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if your Honour wishes to adjourn for five no, minutes. No, I, I think not. Can we bring bring them forward? In that case, I call Mr. Kirk Morton, Pastor Keith Ainge, Mr. George Gainenson and Pastor Brian Houston. from the Bible or an affirmation, each of you? I shall give to this royal commission. That the evidence I shall give, give to this royal commission shall be the truth. Shall be the, the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat. Could you state your full name to the Commission? Brian Charles Houston. And you are the senior pastor and founder of Hillsong Church? That's right, yes. And what are your chief responsibilities in those positions? Um, the, the oversight, the spiritual oversight of the church, uh, I'm answerable to a board uh, within Hillsong Church. Uh, but my role is <coughs> senior pastor and all that entails, so mostly spiritual. Now, there are a number of legal entities which make up Hillsong Church. Is that correct? Yes, but there's a lot more qualified people <laughs> when it comes to all those things. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll just ask you this question. There is one board of directors that is responsible for the overall governance of Hillsong Church. Yes. Are you a member of that board? Yes. Um, Mr... Agajanian, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. No, that's perfect. Could you state your full name to the Commission? George Gregory Agajanian. And you're the General Manager of Hillsong Church? Correct. And what are your chief responsibilities in that position? My role entails anything administrative for the church. That would include the oversight of the safe church framework, HR, legals, anything administrative uh, I oversee. Um, 
Mr. Morton, I'll come to you now. Could you state your full name for the tribune, uh, the commission? Um, my full name is Kirk Alexander Morton. And you are a risk and compliance coordinator with Hillsong Church? That's correct. What, what does that position involve? So the role of uh, risk and compliance coordinator is basically to help um, department heads uh, in key areas of church life, uh, help them to facilitate their risk and compliance obligations. Uh, Pastor Ainge, could you state your full name for the commission? Yes. Keith Ainge. And you are the head of the Safe Church Office within Hillsong Church. That's correct. And I'll come to ask you some more questions about that in a little while. Pastor Houston, as the chairperson of the board, of which we've just spoken, are you the person within Hillsong Church who is ultimately responsible for child protection? Uh, along with the board, yes. Who is responsible for child protection in, board, in Hillsong churches that operate outside Australia? Could you repeat the question, sorry? Who is responsible for child protection in relation to Hillsong churches that operate outside Australia? I could answer that if that's okay. Yes. Yeah, each of our churches around the globe have their own boards. Uh, they are uh, incorporated in their own rights based on the laws of the land. So they, the, the board uh, of each of our churches uh, internationally would be uh, responsible for that. <coughs> Mr. Agajanian, if I can ask this question of you and then ask other witnesses to comment, what, what are the key learnings that the Hillsong Church took away from Case Study 18? Yes, I think uh, some of the key learnings uh, was that while we had child protection policies, we needed a good overhaul of those policies, uh, and uh, and we have uh, we have done that. We've uh, uh, endeavoured to, uh, uh, to to build a framework uh, that is a lot more robust than we had two years ago. Uh, we've learned that uh, we. We needed a strong conflict of interest procedure, which we have implemented as well. Uh, we, have, uh, we have created a safe church office. We've formalized and standardized our procedures and policies so that um, uh, it, the, it's easier for our people to uh, have access to uh, the right people uh, in uh, situations of complaints or allegations. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Uh, I think uh, from my own learnings of it, uh, there was two takeaways. One was uh, the importance of each individual understanding their obligations in terms of reporting, <coughs> and, uh, and that was has been reinforced through uh, uh, strong procedures and um, uh, the provision of adequate training in, uh, in that. I think the other uh, aspect was uh, in terms of um, providing a mechanism which allowed for the ind independent assessment of a situation and the capacity for that um, uh, assessment to then um, inform the reporting of uh, concerns or allegations to relevant authorities. And that's been achieved through the creation of the Safe Church Office. And we'll come back to ask a little bit more about that momentarily. In the written response which Hillsong Church provided recently to the Royal Commission, it was stated that uh, one of the key learnings from Case Study 18 was the significant role that the Board of Directors has in providing oversight and monitoring the effectiveness of child protection measures. Pastor, Houston, as chair of the board, what, what has the board of directors done to increase its oversight? Well, we've overseen across the whole church the rollout of the new childhood policies and procedures, including the setting up of the Safe Church Office, which uh, employs eight people for specifically on um, areas of child safety. Uh, so we have really, I think, done everything we can to set the framework within the culture of our whole church, 
where everybody, especially obviously those in any form of leadership, understand the processes, procedures uh, that would be rolled out uh, it, it, with obviously everyone understanding the first stop off is the safe church office. Um, so I, I, I feel if I looked at it in a broad sense that we've been very, very supportive of um, the, the, uh, the goal to make sure our church is as uh, safe a church as it could possibly be. Mr Agajanian, if I can ask you, the Hillsong Church is an affiliate of the Australian Christian Churches. When Australian Christian Churches was developing its new child protection policies, was Hillsong involved with Australian Christian Churches doing that? Uh, Mr Morton could answer that in more detail, but yes, we did consult with them. And uh, we, we did uh, um, review uh, the policies and uh, procedures they were developing. Uh, Mr. Morton, what did you want wish to add? So uh, shortly after the case study 18, uh, I was uh, given the opportunity um, by the general manager of ACC to um, uh, be a part of a, um, a process, uh, an iterative process, um, where we were given uh, draft documents of the policy uh, the ACC child protection policy and um, myself and a colleague within Hillsong uh, went through uh, a number of stages where we looked at draft documents, provided recommendations and, and fed those back to uh, the ACC. Now that got you to a first level in developing your own um, child protection policies. Did you then engage with Mr Barnett, who was on our previous panel, for further assistance? Yes, yeah, so uh, through the process of um, uh, assisting ACC with their own policy development, um, uh, we became, I guess, more confident in, in our own requirements and, and what we were looking for in terms of um, uh, in not just our child protection policy, but our overall requirements as a church. Uh, we undertook a process internally with uh, a small group of individuals of developing our own uh, policy to begin with um, and uh, through a process from basically July 2015 through to November 2015 we got to a point where we'd um, uh, felt confident in, um, in our own documentation. Uh, it was at that point that we engaged SMR and, um, and in particular Peter Barnett and uh, he was able to provide us with uh, further direction, not only on the development of our policy but in terms of our overall approach to um, child protection. Was there some reason uh, Hillsong didn't just stick with the policies that the ACC had developed? Uh, uh, specifically, the policy that uh, and the overall framework that uh, Hillsong Church has um, provided in this space does address each of the requirements of uh, the Hillsong uh, the ACC policy and the guidelines. Um, but in considering our own approach or our own requirements, um, we would be, uh, it's fair to say, uh, a unique, unique church because of our size, um, because of the number of um, uh, people involved. Uh, and so uh, we felt like we needed something that was uh, more tailored and specialised to our own requirements. Uh, and so we uh, opted for that approach. So it, would it be fair to say that you took the ACC policy and guidelines as a starting point, as the, the minimum standards, and then using those as the minimum standards, you went further and crafted a policy to suit the needs of your own organisation? Yes. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, the, the significant difference uh, in terms of our policy is uh, the scope. Uh, our policy uh, applies to our whole church and the safety of our whole church. Um, ACC's policy is specific to child protection. Uh, and we've increased our scope to not only uh, matters of uh, child sexual abuse or child abuse, but also 
um, brought into a, other considerations such as general wealth, uh, uh, workplace health and safety requirements. Uh, Pastor Ainge, the Safer Churches policy that Hillsong adopted uh, created four new roles within the Hillsong Church to facilitate child protection. And, one of those was the establishment of the Safe Church Office. Another was to create a head of the Safe Church Office. Another was a head of agency. And a fourth step was to appoint investigators. First of all, can you tell us about the Safe Church Office, of which you're head? Yes. The whole basis of the establishment of the Safe Church Office is to... Um, to bring child protection particularly, but also work health and safety under one heading to make sure that it's handled consistently across the 26 locations of Hillsong Church and um, in the many areas of operation. And so the Ch Safe Church Office is set up principally to ensure that we cover all that's necessary to keep our children, our youth safe, and in fact, in a general sense, to keep Hillsong people safe as we're ministering to them. And there's a head of agency. What, what's that all about? The actual position of head of agency comes from the Ombudsman in New South Wales. We have a connection with the Ombudsman. And the Ombudsman requires that every agency or every organisation that um, relates to them has a head of agency. And it's the responsibility of the head of agency effectively to, to sign the effective... Uh, appropriate documents to make findings in relation to investigation. And so the head of agency is someone who's beyond the Safe Church office to whom we report and uh, we give an account and the head of agency has to make that decision. And um, Mr Agajanian was appointed by the board as the head of agency. So effectively, I report to him, um, but all of the work in relation to investigation and reporting to agencies is done through the Safe Church Office. And Hillsong has actually appointed its own investigators, is that right? We have appointed some investigators and we probably we need to appoint more. We're in the process of appointing investigators. How many do you have at the moment? Currently we have um, three people who are functioning as investigators from different capacities. One is a um, a police sergeant, all of them in a voluntary capacity, but one a police sergeant, another one a lawyer, and um, yeah, two lawyers, in fact. Could I show you a document appearing at tab six of the Hillsong bundle? This is the Hillsong Safe Church Framework Overview. Is this, uh, uh, and I appreciate that your concept of safe church extends beyond child protection, but is this the starting point in terms of uh, understanding Hillsong's approach to its safe church? Yes. All right. Um, now, this is not a publicly available document, is it? Yes, it is. It is? Yes. It's on, it's on our Hillsong website. And then... Sitting underneath that document, can I show you the document at tab 8? This is the, uh, the training manual that sits under that overall framework document, is that right? Yes, that's right. And this, this is the detailed list of procedures that, that's similar in some ways to the manual we saw from the ACC this morning. I'd suggest it's probably 80% the same as the ACC manual. We've only changed it to make it specific to Hillsong areas, reporting procedures that actually are relevant to Hillsong. With the ACC, they're dealing with 1,000 churches of various sizes, and so we've tried to make it more specific to our particular need. But and the bulk of it, 80% of it or more, I think, would be identical. And uh, we heard this morning from the ACC witnesses that uh, an important feature of their child protection regime was training 
people in that regime and that this manual was a resource, but that training people in the applicable processes and principles was important. What, what sort of training is conducted by Hillsong and who is trained? We um, prepared this manual. Um, it was completed in August of 2016. So we took the ACC manual and we made adjustments to it. It was completed in August 2016. And um, we had four people trained, including myself, to actually do the training. And we have been, since September, conducting training programs for Hillsong Church. We've trained all of our pastors. I say all, there may be one or two who've missed out because of illness or holidays, and we still have, it's an ongoing process. And we're in the process of training all of our child-related volunteers, as well as staff members of Hillsong. And it's a six-hour training course that we conduct for each person. The latest figure I've seen is that I think there are close to, close to 1,700 people have been trained by the four people who are doing the training since September last year. And we expect that that's going to double this year because we, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And do you avail yourself of any of the training offered by the ACC or are you doing it all in-house through your own trainers? Um, we're effectively doing it all in-house simply because there are elements of this training that are very important for our pastors to understand and our people to understand in relation to reporting and dealing with concerns that are slightly different to the way the ACC handle them. And is just oh, yes. Sorry, just to clarify, so the process in which our facilitators um, became uh, ready to provide the training was as uh, they actually attended a number of training sessions conducted by SMR on behalf of ACC um, and uh, through that process there was a, a mentoring and, and handing over of that responsibility to us um, so that we could adequately provide the same level of training at the standard that uh, ACC were providing. Thank you. Now, the training, you've mentioned the six-hour training for pastors. Is that something that happens on a one-off basis or is it repeated periodically or what's the situation? As part of the ACC, all of our pastors have to be retrained every three years. Um, we will have the same policy to all of our child-related workers, although that's I'm not sure that's actually required by the ACC, but we will certainly require that of our child-related workers. And we also see this training as stage one. Um, SMR has other training courses that we're planning to roll out and make available to our people too. Um, but the reality is we have so many people to train with the initial training that our focus has been on dealing with the initial training first. And who is this manual, the Safe Training, the Safe Church Training Manual, made available to within your organisation? It's made available to everyone who does the training. It's actually a, effectively a tool to be used in the training, and then they take it home with them as they completed the training. Now, in addition to this um, Safe Church Training Manual, Hillsong Church has developed a large number of standard operating procedures and. You'll be aware that a number of those are in the tender bundle. If I could take you, for example, to the one appearing at tab 10. And again, Pastor Ange, I may ask you about this since you appear to be the sponsor of this standard operating procedure. This is one relating to the recruitment and selection for child-related roles. That's correct. And this sets out your screening requirements, does it? It does. It talks about um, identifying those who can apply to be in a child-related role. And then we have a process where when someone applies to be in a child-related role, they go onto our database, our My Hillsong database, but they're not allowed to function until they are green-lighted, which means that they've completed all the requirements of this particular procedure. Could I take you to another of the, um, well, this is a slightly different document, uh, it's the one appearing at tab 16. Now if 
I could just have that. Yes, yeah, so the whole page is available. This um, sets out in a diagrammatic form your complaint handling procedure, doesn't it? That's correct, yes. Right. Um, will a complaint only be followed through if it's a written complaint? No, we actually talk about a, dis a concern or disclosure of harm and so any concern that's identified to us, regardless of whether it's in writing or verbally, we deal with concerns. Yeah, so that, does that mean that it's not necessary for a complainant to commit their complaint to writing for you to... That's so correct, right. yes. We'll deal with it. We will get something. Obviously, we take records of uh, interviews with the person so that we're clear in relation to our document keeping, but we'll deal with issues as soon as they raise as a concern or a disclosure. Uh, what is the Hillsong policy with respect to mandatory reporting? Of course, clergy aren't mandatory reporters in New South Wales. We take exactly the same stance as the ACC in that whilst mandatory reporting is not necessarily required, we report any concern or any disclosure that we believe... Um, uh, deserves to be reported. In other words, if there's any disclosure of any sexual inappropriate behaviour with a child, then we determine that we are mandatory reporters from our perspective and we report it. Uh, Mr Agajanian, is it right that as you were introducing your new child protection policies at Hillsong, you made all of your volunteers who worked with children reapply? That's correct, and they've also been trained as part of the training that uh, Pastor Ainge has outlined. We've made them, we have, yes, we've gone through the process of reapplication and training for those individuals. How does Hillsong monitor the question of child sexual abuse within its organisation? We hear, we heard in relation to the ACC that there's a permanent agenda item at both the state executive and the national executive level. What's the situation here, Pastor Houston? Perhaps I can talk to that. Um, I uh, regularly um, attend the uh, Audit and Risk Committee uh, meetings. The, sorry? The uh, Audit, uh, and, risk audit committee. and Risk Committee meetings. Uh, and so part of my role, uh, and Keith attends the same meetings as well, um, part of our role is to update um, the Audit and Risk Committee on areas of risk and compliance. Uh, obviously, uh, child protection is a key focus of that. And so um, at each of these meetings, we'll avail them of uh, uh, information as far as the pro uh, uh, progress of the implementation of our, um, of our new framework and update them on any um, new obligations that uh, um, uh, are required based on uh, state-based uh, changes in legislation. If, if I can just add to that, sorry, the head of agency actually answers to the Audit and Risk Committee, and so we would report back to them, as uh, Mr Morton is stating. Is any kind of safe church training made available to the children who participate in the services of your organisation? Uh, it, it's interesting that you, uh, what you're describing there, and I, I, I know that it's part of the elements uh, of a, a child safe organisation. Um, the, the short answer is, is that um, th through the, our programs, we deliver um, uh, an opportunity for children to uh, explain their situation and where they're at uh, in a ver uh, through um, what we would term discipleship, but it's um, it is uh, through uh, curriculum-based programs and um, and through small group interactions where um, uh, leaders talk with children. Uh, in that process, um, we have our, our, our leaders are acutely aware of indicators of harm, which is part of the um, manual which uh, SMR has, has provided. Uh, in terms of providing training, it is something that we've discussed in terms of uh, an opportunity for improvement. Uh, the challenge for us is that uh, our programs, quite simply, aren't 
um, uh, a, a requirement. They're not mandatory programs. People uh, attend church uh, at their own discretion. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, from week to week, we don't know who's going to be attending our children's programs. And um, one of the issues with that is providing um, parents or caregivers with appropriate notice or understanding of what the training is that we intend to provide. Um, and so that, that is something that we've been um, discussing but haven't um, concretely um, settled a, a position on at this point in time. Um, Your Honour, I, I see the time. I have about 10 minutes left. We'll, we'll take lunch.
is available to young or children associated with Hillsong Church to assist them in making a complaint about child sexual abuse? We, are in the, we have some things that are available and um, we're in the process of doing other things at the moment. The one thing that we have available is that um, on our Hillsong website we have all of the details that in relation to making a complaint or um, bringing a concern. We have made available to the whole church just very recently a video that talks about how to respond to a concern or a complaint. But we're in the process of developing a brochure that's going to be available to families and children that will have just an indication of how the Safe Church operates and how to bring a complaint or a, um, an allegation if it arises. We don't currently have that operating, but it's actually in the process of being prepared. So you, you do agree that that's something that Hillsong needs, some way of communicating with children about how they can make complaints? Absolutely. We've been in the process of um, releasing all of the information about Safe Church progressively through the church and to different areas, and that's one of the that's the area that we're still working on, and we're very close to completing that. Now, we heard evidence in this morning's panel about the Australian Christian Church's helpline. Um, do you does Hillsong have any relationship with that helpline? No, we effectively run our own helpline in, within the church. We have a one eight hundred number. We have a safe church um, email address and other ways of communicating to safe church if there are any issues. And we relate to SMR if we have any questions in relation to it. So any concern that anyone has goes straight, according to our policy, to the safe church department. Have any, has it ever been notified to you that any of the contacts on the ACC helpline have related to Hillsong? No, I'm not aware that there have been any. Is anyone else able to assist with that? Just rephrase the question. I'm just wondering whether um, Hillsong has ever been made aware as to whether any of the calls to the helpline, the ACC helpline, have concerned Hillsong. Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. No response? <laughs> OK. I'd like to turn now to ask you about um, one of the findings in case study 18, which was that Hillsong did not have a conflict of interest policy that considered familial disputes. It's right now, Mr Agajanian, that there is a conflict of interest policy? Yes, it's embedded in our safe church policy. It's a procedure. It's, uh, it's not a policy, it's a procedure within the safe church policy. Could I show you a document appearing at tab 25? <clears throat> it's in fact the uh, conflicts of interest is one of the Hillsong Church's standard operating procedures these days. And a, a conflict of interest, if I can have it scrolled down a little bit further, is defined in the definition section on that first page. Then if we turn over the page, the pinpoint 0151, there's quite, and if we scroll down the page, there's quite a lengthy def description of how one identifies a conflict of interest. Now, how widely is this policy disseminated within Hillsong? So I can talk to that. Um... Uh, let me start by explaining that um, under the ACNC uh, guidelines, we're required to have a, a governance conflict of interest policy. Can I stop you there? The ACNC, is that, yes, charities, yeah. Australian yes. charities? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, not-for-profit commission, that's Thank correct. You. 
So we have a, a governance policy. Um, the process that's described in that policy points towards company secretary, um, which is appropriate for governance arrangements. By designing this procedure, we specifically wanted to address conflicts of interest arising as a result of the reports that were um, received by the Safe Church Office. And uh, this conflict of interest procedure is designed to assist particularly the head of the Safe Church Office with uh, managing potential uh, issues that arise with um, his handling of, uh, or overseeing of the handling of investigations. It's not a procedure that's prescribed to uh, all child-related workers. It, it, it's more specifically um, in relation to the uh, functioning of the Safe Church Office itself. If I could comment also in relation to that. Yes. As soon as we receive any concern or disclosure, one of the first things that we have to do according to our procedure, and it's something that our office does, is to determine if there is any potential or actual conflict of interest with anyone who's likely to be handling that, um, that disclosure and to mitigate it and to deal with it appropriately. And the procedure actually describes how we deal with it appropriately. And if I could add just one more point, I think one of the reasons we have gone to uh, volunteer, uh, external volunteers as investigators, is to keep that, that distance with <coughs> many of the staff or, or senior team as being those investigators. We want it to be at arm's length. We want those investigations to be objective. When you talk about volunteer investigators, I had understood that Hillsong had retained some investigators as part of its permanent staff. What, what are the volunteer investigators? No, it's actually... I, sorry, if I could answer that. We actually don't have any permanent staff as investigators. Oh. We have um, people who are a part of Hillsong Church who have particular um, capacities and have particular qualifications who we use, as volunteer, uh, we use as volunteer investigators. They volunteer their time to investigate. But we also have, as part of our procedure, that in a case that was considered <coughs> critical, then we would use external paid investigators to deal with those things. We haven't had a situation like that arise up to now, um, but it could happen. I want to turn now to discuss the question of Redress, and I'll direct this question to you, Pastor Houston, as the, as the leader of the organisation. It's right that Hillsong does not have a formal policy of redress at the moment? Uh, my understanding is that within the framework, the Safe Church framework, it covers a lot of areas of redress, but we don't have a specific uh, redress yeah, um, policy right now. I would say, though, that um, I think that we're very, very aware of the need for us to have a full understanding of, of redress and what that, uh, certainly what the Royal Commission's recommendations are on redress. And I think we're waiting to see more detail of what the government's recommendations are. And so it's, it's something that we're very aware of and... Uh, and uh, feel positive about. If I can just add to that, we, ha we do have a procedure called caring for people uh, who've made a disclosure. And within that, we cover uh, several of the key elements of redress, which includes um, uh, the initial personal uh, direct engagement with the survivor, the offering of counseling and psychological care. So we do that as part of our procedures already. It is not something that uh, we are waiting for a, a redress scheme in order to do that. That is already part of how we, we already uh, function. If I can take you to the document at tab 22. <clears throat> yes. Uh, and I'll direct this to you, Mr. Agajanian. Is this the... the Correct. Policy you're referring to, the, yes, the it caring is. for people following a disclosure. That's correct. Right. But so far as financial redress is concerned, it's right, Pastor Houston, that there is no financial redress policy? Not at this point. And but that doesn't mean that we're not open to it, though. 
And the procedures don't exclude it. In fact, there, the process should uh, a, uh, a claim be made would be where we would, in line with this procedure, engage uh, the victim or survivor. Uh, we would get all the facts, the relevant facts, the extent of the, of the abuse, the severity, the impact of the abuse on the individual. We would then seek external advice through, uh, be it our lawyers and other external advisors. We would then compile a report that we would table to our board, and ultimately our board would make a decision on, on any monetary payment. And within that report, we would also um, uh, reference the, the commission's recommendations in the redress uh, document that's been released. And on that point, Pastor Houston, that you, you referred to the fact that the Commonwealth has recently announced a redress scheme. Is it the case that Hillsong will be looking or will consider signing up to that scheme? I think I think we would we will consider absolutely. It's a little hard to know what you're signing up for though, when you, there's no information on it. Have, have you looked at the information that has been? released by the government the government at this stage? I personally haven't, but I've yes, had conversations. Yes, we have, yeah. and uh, it is, as uh, Pastor Brian has said, it is, uh, there's a lot of detail lacking, and we are waiting to see what, what that uh, would look like. Uh, and should our movement also release any, any form of redress recommendations or policies, we would consider those as well. Uh, Mr. Agajanian, the Royal Commission at the same time as making recommendations about address made recommendations about uh, civil litigation when a, a claim of child sexual abuse moves through the <coughs> courts. And some of its recommendations related to uh, institutions, including church institutions, identifying a proper defendant to be sued. Uh, in the event of allegations of child sex abuse. Is there a, a proper defendant to be sued for Hillsong? Hillsong, uh, Hillsong uh, the church entity, operates as a company limited by guarantee. So there is a legal entity there, absolutely. Is that the employing entity? Yes. That's the entity which employs all pastors, for example? Correct. The employing entity, the entity that operates all of our church services, it is our entity that uh, conducts church in Australia. <clears throat> that uh, report of the Royal Commission, to which I've just referred, also makes recommendations about institutions adopting model litigant policies. Has Hillsong given any consideration to that in the context of uh, litigation for child sexual abuse? I'm not clear on, on your question, if you could I'm just... I'm sorry, I, it yeah. was rather bundled up. The Royal Commission, in its redress and civil litigation report, mm -hmm. made recommendations regarding institutions who may be sued right. because of child sexual abuse mm -hmm. to adopt model litigant policies. Are you familiar with those recommendations? Uh, no, I'm not. Is anyone on this panel familiar with those recommendations? Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with those recommendations, yes. Has Hillsong given any consideration to adopting such model litigant policy? Uh, I, I think the, the short answer is that uh, we've cons we consider those as part of our overall redress approach, which we'll be looking to formalise um, once a national scheme has been um, uh, verified. I'd now like to ask a... Uh, Sorry, before you leave that, um, that may only happen late next year. Yes. And in the meantime, you may be instructing your lawyers, model lit litigant uh, principles require a lawyer to adopt particular practices in engaging with victims and survivors. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in the redress recommendations which require you to wait for that uh, moral and principled approach. Yes. Uh, have you thought of it from that basis? So uh, the recommendations describe uh, interim arrangements and uh, our position is that um, through this caring for people and following disclosure, we have a process for considering the needs uh, of the circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis 
and through that process we will look at um, the individual requirements that um, uh, the, the, the victim or survivor has and, um, and adopt any uh, recommendations along the way that the, uh, the Commission would have in, in response to that. Moving now to the question of reportable conduct, the response that Hillsong gave to the Royal Commission recently said that the Deputy Ombudsman had explained that Hillsong was likely caught within the scope of the New South Wales Ombudsman <coughs> Oversight Regime. Mr uh, Agajanian, are you able to tell us what you were told by the Ombudsman? Yes, and I'll also get Mr. Morton to um, expand on it. But uh, because uh, we operate uh, uh, summer camps, uh, usually in January, for for some of our um, uh, for our young people and our children, uh, which I believe uh, go beyond uh, accommodation uh, for a couple of days or longer, I think that's what's picked it up. But I, I'll let you uh, expand on that. It's a technicality at the yeah. moment. Uh, we have one camp that's run through fixed accommodation. Uh, and so our involvement in the reportable conduct scheme is, in, in a word, tenuous. Um, but we hang on to that. We want to be part of yeah. the scheme. Uh, it's uh, how we're building our framework, basically, uh, in, in the structure of it. So um, I, I think uh, if there's an outcome uh, through our participation in this hearing it would be that um, uh, in New South Wales our, our, our position uh, as part of the Royal, uh, as part of the reportable conduct scheme is uh, is, is, uh, is secured more fastly uh, and I note that uh, in Victoria the Royal, uh, reportable conduct scheme which will be a part of uh, commencing in uh, January 2018 uh, does fairly and squarely include re religious institutions within its scope, uh, and uh, we feel like we should be um, just as secure in, in that in New South Wales. Mike Wayne, if I could, sorry, could I add yes. something to that? As the um, head of Safe Church, <coughs> I appreciate that our the reason for being under the reportable conduct scheme is a little bit nebulous, but we believe that it's an incredibly positive thing for us. And um, we found the support of the Deputy Ombudsman and his office for us has been outstanding. We're happy to be a part of the Reportable Conduct Scheme. We believe, in fact, that all churches should be under the Reportable Conduct Scheme because of the benefit that it gives to the churches in being able to understand situations. And um, so we're very happy to be a part of it. And as a, an organisation that operates nationally, would it be your preference to see a nationally consistent scheme of reportable conduct? We would be very happy to have a national scheme mm. as long as it maintains the um, relationship that we have in New South Wales. Because I think the strength of the New South Wales scheme is that it's not just an administrator coming in and adding another la layer of... Um, responsibility, but it's actually a supportive organisation that's helping us to fulfil what we need to do to keep our children safe. While on the topic of consistency, can I ask you about the working with children checks? Now, again, as a nationally operating organisation, you will have found that uh, the working with children checks work differently in different states and territories. Do you have a preference for a nationally consistent scheme? We would prefer to have a national scheme. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that your view too, Pastor? Yeah. Can I just add the, uh, the, the best standard in terms of our uh, position is that uh, uh, would be the standard set by um, the New South Wales Children's Guardian. One last matter. There may be occasions where people who are convicted of or who have been convicted of child sexual abuse or who have been accused of child sexual abuse wish to participate in the life of the church, for example, as worshippers. We've heard in the Anglican wrap-up sessions that the Anglican Church has done a lot of work in terms of developing risk management procedures for uh, 
safe ministry where such people do wish to worship in the church. What's Hillsong's attitude to such people worshipping at Hillsong and what, if anything, has done been done about their risk management? I, I can answer certainly a part of that. <laughs> Actually, for a long, long time, I've been extremely vocal that no uh, convicted paedophile Nobody who's made any kind of uh, confession of inappropriate behaviour towards children uh, is welcome at Hillsong Church at all. And so on numerous occasions we've told people they, they, they can't come uh, to church. And so that's that actually goes back a long, long way. And I've spoken to our staff, I've spoken to our teams about that. Uh, so we've got a no-tolerance policy on paedophiles because we have a massive children's ministry, obviously, and young person's ministry, so we just don't believe it's the right place for them to be. And if I can add, that's been formalised in our uh, safe church policy. Anything else to add? Uh, no. I think it does um, reflect the fact that Hillsong Church, as um, Brian said, is very much... Um, ministering to children and young people and we certainly are concerned for the registrable sex offenders and we're concerned that they find um, support and encouragement but we just don't believe that Hillsong is a place for that to happen. There are other places where that can happen other than in Hillsong Church. I have no further questions. Yeah. Um, just uh, uh, Pastor Houston, you would have heard the interchange with uh, Pastor Alcorn in relation to the training and uh, formation and ultimate uh, acceptance of pastors. Can I just ask a couple of questions in relation to Hillsong? How many pastors are there actually in Hillsong? Huh. About 150. And do most of those pastors, are they trained within your own facilities or are most of those trained external to Hillsong? We have a, we have a, a college, a Bible college, uh, which working in with the ACC's college takes students all the way up to higher education and so it is a big part of our um, college courses and so on to talk on, I actually was talking to uh, one of our people there over over the break so in their ethics classes and their worldview class, Christian worldview classes and their family classes, all of them they teach issues related to sexuality and to child safety as well and so most of our pastors that we would bring through into our church would come through that college. And is that the Hillsong International Leadership College? Yes. yes. And as you say, and most of your pastors, as you say, come through that. Yeah. What's the ultimate screening um, of uh, those that wish to, in fact, become ministers within Hillsong? We've heard about the processes through the, uh, the Australian Christian churches, but what's your own internal processes prior to somebody actually ending up working with you as a pastor? Okay. Can I respond to that? Yeah. Uh, if I could say that most of those who are pastors at Hillsong Church have developed through the church's leaders. There are not too many people come in as established pastors, so there's a whole process of leadership. And with leadership, anyone coming into leadership or working with children in any capacity, then they have to go through the whole process of working with children check interview and it's a specific interview that's um, very formalised and two reference checks and so most people who become Hillsong pastors go through that process initially and then when they apply to become a pastor they in the vast majority of cases would actually go through the ACC process of accreditation of becoming a probation minister and then an ordained minister in their process in their a pathway towards becoming a pastor. And as senior pastor, um, uh, Pastor Houston, do you believe that the processes that are in place at Hillsong, firstly, and then secondly, more broadly, within the ACC churches, is a process that is likely to, um, to use my expression that I use with Pastor Alcott, weed out those that may have inappropriate predispositions? Now, I want to be clear that often that's not possible to, to weed people out and to pick that up. But do you think that the screening mechanisms in place at Hillsong and more generally um, are as good as they can be in relation to that? 
Look, most of most of the pastors who would come into our church, who would become pastors, have proven themselves well and truly inside the life of the church. So they've been in leadership roles, they've been watched for a long time, they've proven themselves as credible people uh, with good character. Uh, and so it's not as though we advertise in the paper and, you know, just bring in uh, strangers as pastors. And so in terms of all of that, there's a, a, a quite a degree of safeguard there. Um, at the end of the day, you never quite know deep down in someone's head or my or or heart what might be going on in there, and so I, you know, I can't vouch that uh, we would catch every single sure. person who uh, was unhealthy, but we definitely do our best. And in terms of the the broader uh, movement, are, are you satisfied um, as best as you can be that the processes in place by the ACC are as robust as they can be in relation to the appointment of ministers more generally in the movement that you're part of? Yeah, I haven't been involved at the executive level for eight years, so I, I, I look at it just as senior pastor of a church. And to be honest, I spend a lot of my time outside of Australia now, and so... Uh, I'm not always even up with all of the, the change that's been happening inside our greater movement. Uh, but I do feel that they're being diligent, for sure, and, and trying their best. And if, uh, if it can be pointed out that there's more we could be doing and better things we could be doing, I think everyone would be open to it. And in terms of theological training and training by other institutions, you've established your own. But do you have a sense that the training of current-day pastors, pastors that are being accredited, is of an appropriate standard, or is one of the reasons you established your own was because there were weaknesses in the training that was otherwise available? Um, yeah, look, I, I just couldn't comment on the broader movement because I'm not involved enough to even know what training is given uh, through Alpha Crucis, the, the ACC uh, course and so on. So I think those are questions for the ACC board executive. Um, but in our own church, I, I feel like we're, we're doing our, our best and if there's ways that we can do it better, we'll certainly be open to doing that. And in relation to the international churches, uh, uh, are, are the pastors trained through the Australian, um, the Hillsong International Leadership College as well, or are they likely to be trained um, overseas? The overseas one, many, many of them actually have come from it, the college here in Australia. Our college is very international, only only maybe 25, 30% of the students come from Australia. So they come from all over the world. So oftentimes we send them back <laughs> to the countries they may have come from. Okay, thank you. Your Honour, may, may I make a point about the college and the interning, internal um, writings of it? Um, one of the features of the college is um, the uh, facilitation of chaplaincy. Uh, and so uh, within our college there are chaplains appointed at key campuses and they have a um, ongoing relationship with uh, all our students, not just those who uh, end up becoming pastors in our own church, but through that they um, are able to uh, address in, uh, the challenges that they face personally and um, and so that uh, is a mechanism in which we can produce better leaders who uh, have have, have um, uh, resolved issues in their personal life. Mm. That's a good point. And the average length of training for a pastor in the Hillsong would be what? Uh, well, anything from two to five years. Is that formal training through the college or is yes. that... That's yeah, that would college. be the formal training part. But like I say, many of them, their training's gone well beyond that by their involvement in church life, yep. which is where we tend to see you know, people emerge who, who have the potential to be great leaders and pastors. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of questions primarily for Mr Morton. Is it possible, though, to bring up uh, in the Safe Church Training Manual, page 32, under the um, heading uh, electronic cyberbullying, social networking and grooming on the internet. Mm. Perhaps before it comes up, Mr Morton, could I ask you in terms of that topic though, uh, here it is now, of um, electronic cyberbullying, social networking and grooming on the internet. What would you describe as the level of risk for Hillsong in relation to that in terms of people in positions of authority 
Hillsong misusing technology. Uh, uh, the re reality is, is that online um, abuse and and uh, whether that's in the form of sexual or otherwise uh, is um, becoming more prevalent, and so it is a, an issue that we're. Uh, looking to um, monitor and, and manage uh, better. Uh, I think the benefit that Hillsong has in terms of our communication uh, through uh, our online formats is that um, we have quite a centralised and organised structure for communicating. So uh, Hillsong has its own Instagram uh, accounts that relate to specific campuses and to specific age groups within those campuses. And so what it does is it eliminates the need for individual leaders to engage with individual program participants, individual children within our congregation, um, uh, because those arrangements are already in place. And so that, to us, is a, a key risk mitigator. Um, the other risk mitigator for us is obviously the training that's being provided. And um, the uh, other mitigator for us in terms of risk is the um, understanding that um, uh, what does occur in an online format is uh, uh, considered reportable conduct uh, and, it can, and should be reported to the Safe Church Office. And so um, much of uh, our own Safe Church Office uh, investigations do relate to uh, online um, uh, matters. If Thank I could you. just add to that, we, we wouldn't communicate with <laughs> minors without parental permission. I'm sorry, I missed it. I said we, as a church, would not communicate with minors without parental permission. No, you use the word minors in your policy. What's a minor? Uh, anyone below 16. Yes. Well, below 18, in fact. 18, yeah. yeah. Below 18. 18 is a minor. Slightly yeah, the different. question, if I could just add to that, the question of minor <laughs> is an issue because it varies from state to state. Yeah. But we take the policy that anyone under the age of 18 is a child from our perspective, and that's the approach that we take in all areas because we operate across different states. It's the first um, few words there are very similar, if not identical, to the ACC's policy. Um, Mr Morton, would you agree that this explosion of electronic communication, that, that's ongoing, that it hasn't stopped? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And in that space, is there anything more you'd like to see in terms of advice or educational materials or regulation or legislation from, uh, from government outside of Hillsong? Uh, I understand that the Commission is going to be providing um, uh, more information relating to child-to-child -child, uh, matters, and I would expect uh, or hope uh, that, that in that uh, advice or in that direction that there is um, um, the, the, the matters of online um, abuse being addressed in that, because that is... Um, uh, definitely prevalent in, in the child-to-child -child relationship. Yes, child-to-child -child relationship is very much a matter of interest for the Royal Commission. Um, um, uh, but beyond that, uh, from uh, just putting the Royal Commission to one side, um, state and federal governments, is there anything you'd seek from them? I'm not saying there should be, I just wondered if there was. Uh, I, I, not at this stage. Uh, anyone else like to comment on that? If I could make one comment in relation to um, just the whole incidence of the use of the internet, it is a concern to us and um, we do try to mitigate it as much as we can. We have training that takes place with parents as well as with children in relation to the appropriate use of um, social media and that's something that our youth and children's department is doing. Um, but. In relation to things that need to be reported and um, incidents relating to social media and the transmission of photographs and things become reportable conduct. In the last, um, well, in the time that we've been involved in reportable conduct, I've got records here that we've actually reported five reportable conduct. We've had a lot of incidents that have been reported to us and we've reported to other agencies, but to the Ombudsman as a reportable conduct, there have been five incidents. Um, 
at least three of those have related to young leaders sending inappropriate text messages or something. And so we are aware that that is a significant area and it's one that we work very hard at training our leaders in relation to. I'm not sure it's relevant, but um, we also have an initiative through our youth groups uh, called Make Bullying History. Uh, does a lot of educating inside schools and uh, has a movement called the String Movement, which is all about peers encouraging other peers around uh, not bullying. So we're sort of pre proactive on, on, on the issue of bullying as well. If I could just add, in relation to the question you asked, one, one final comment. I think it would assist if there was some type of educational program. I'm, I'm talking about not necessarily it, it could be in schools. It could be a broader based thing to help uh, young people, minors in particular, understand some of the behavior is illegal. And I don't think many of our young people understand that when they take a photo of, of an inappropriate situation and then circulate that. They don't understand. Now, as Pastor Ainge has said in our youth ministries and children's ministries, we try and educate our, our young people. But I think by and large our communities don't, the youth and children of our communities don't really understand the significance at law with regard to dissem disseminating information like that. So I do believe that some kind of educational <laughs> program at whatever level would be helpful. Thank you. Anyone at the bar table? May I ask tab 14 be brought up on the screen, please? The need to say near the microphone, otherwise no one can hear. The Ministry to Known Offenders. Um, questions directed to Mr Morton. You were asked questions by Council Assisting about uh, the existence of such a procedure and it was originally asked of Pastor Houston and then you supplemented it. Um, is this the standard operating procedure to which uh, which was developed in response to this need? Yes. All right, and uh, if we could scroll down to um, page 0108. Thank you. Um, thank you. You'll see by reason, uh, so by reference to it, that it's not only confined to regist registrable sex offenders, but if we scroll down further, please, we can see that it applies to um, persons of concern um, who are not necessarily charged or convicted or even registrable. So that is it part of the standard operating procedures for Hillsong that it has a procedure not only for known sex offenders but for persons of concern. That's correct. Such that uh, consistent with what Senior Pastor Houston said that not only uh, is it a place which does not uh, tolerate registrable offenders but it seeks to uh, minister and monitor persons of concern. Yes. I finished that document. Thank you. Can um, document at tab 22 be brought up, please? I'll just move to another issue, if I may. Uh, the panel was asked questions by council assisting about its adoption of the model litigant approaches in the recommendations uh, for redress and civil litigation report of this commission. And uh, the question by council assisting was the extent to which uh, there was knowledge of the recommendations in that report and secondly, the implementation of any of the recommendations in that report. Um, by reference to the model litigant approaches uh, for the benefit of the Commission, this is approach number 99. One of the approaches suggested is that the government, non-government institutions should publish the guidelines they adopt or otherwise make them available to claimants and their legal representatives. Um, I think question to Pastor Ainge, you spoke earlier of a 
I think this morning of a, um, a, a telecast or, a, or a, a video which was broadcast to the congregation of Hillsong Church. Yes, that's right. Um, about four weeks ago, three to four weeks ago, I, together with the youth pastor and the children's pastor from the church, made a three-minute video which relates to just what the Surf Ch Safe Church office is, how it functions, and also the training that we give to our leaders and the monitoring of leaders. But he went on to talk about the fact that if anyone has any concern, this is what you have to do in relation to the concern. It also directed people to exact with actually with pictures to the um, part of our website that talks about our safe church um, framework. And that was made three weeks ago and just this week it has actually been um, emailed to, I think the figure that I had was at 52,137 email addresses of people who are connected to Hillsong Church in Australia. And that's a three minute video which is for available for everyone to see to help them to understand just how our Safe Church framework works. Um, relevant to the model litigant approaches, one of the recommendations, it's recommendation 97, um, suggests guidelines should be designed to minimise potential for re-traumatisation of claimants and to avoid unnecessary adversarial responses to claims. Um, question to Mr Morton. Uh, at tab 22 on the screen. Can we scroll down to four, please? Thank you. Uh, is that such a procedure which has been implemented to address at least that part of the model litigant uh, suggested approach in this Commission's report? Ah, uh, yes, it is. Um, so that consistent with what Pastor Houston said at the beginning of his answer to Council Assisting's question, is that there are aspects of the model litigant approach um, which have been implemented as part of the safe church policy within Hillsong? Yes. Thank you. They're my questions. Thank you. No questions. Nothing sure. arising. Well, that brings your contribution to an end. Thank you very much. It's Thank you. that you've done some considerable thinking about these issues since the earlier occasion for which the Commission is grateful. Thank you again today, and you're now excused. Thank you. And we'll adjourn until Monday morning, is that right? 10 o'clock? That's right. Yes. 10 o'clock on Monday. All stand.